Welcome again to our STI clinical update webinar called Introduction to Syphilis and Congenital Syphilis. This is a Phoenix IHS and California Prevention Training Center or CAPTC event. My name is Kelly Johnson. I'm the medical director for the CAPTC and I'm so happy to be here with you today. I first just wanted to thank you all for joining this webinar. You all really serve such an important population and we're really happy to be partnering with you on this super important topic. I'll be emceeing today's webinar and I'll be going over some introductory slides. So first, a little bit about the CAPTC. We are a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. We're sponsored by the CDC and we're one of eight members of a larger national network of STD clinical prevention training centers. What do we do? We provide virtual and in-person training events, technical assistance, clinical tools, and STI clinical consultation services focusing on complex issues in STI patient care. To learn more about us or the NNPTC, you can visit those websites listed on this slide. The CAPTC also runs the STD Clinical Consultation Network, or STDCCN, which is a really important resource, so I just wanted to mention it. This is an online consultation network where providers can go, submit a complex clinical question, and you'll get an answer from a subject matter expert within one to five business days, and that can be either by phone or email, whichever you prefer. Here's our financial disclosure for today. We have nothing to disclose. And here's our CME disclosure stating that today's webinar is offered at 3.25 units. So here's what you need to do to earn those 3.25 units. First, you must have registered for the webinar on the NNPT site by January 10th at 3 p.m. Registration has now closed. Then you must attend the webinar today live and in full. Attendance will be recorded as you sign on, and unfortunately we cannot give credit if you are viewing a recording of this webinar after the fact. Next, you must complete the post-course survey evaluation by January 19th, 2024. You'll receive a link to the post-course survey evaluation um, survey 24 hours after the webinar, and it will come from an email address called training at nnptc.org. And this will go to the same email address that you use to register for today's event. To make sure you receive that email, make sure you add training at nnpt.org to your safe and trusted senders list, and make sure you check your spam and junk folders if you don't see this email. If you do meet today's CME requirements, here's what will happen next. You'll receive CME notification by email on, by February 11th, 2024. This comes from a different email address. It's captc at ucsf.edu. We'll include a link to claim your certificate through our CME provider, which is the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. To make sure that you get your CME notification, add this email address again, captc at ucsf.edu to your safe and trusted defenders list. And remember to check those spam and junk folders if you don't see it. We get a lot of questions about this. So here's what's gonna happen in terms of the post webinar materials. We will send out a handout and webinar recording with about two weeks after the webinar. This will just come automatically to your email. You don't need to request those materials separately. Again, just be looking out for emails from us at captc at ucsf.edu. I think we're all pretty familiar with Zoom at this point, but here's a couple of quick housekeeping notes about Zoom for today. So the Q&A will be turned on for attendees, but the microphone, video, and chat will be turned off. Only presenters will have access to the microphone and video. To use the Q&A, go ahead and click on the Q&A icon, which will be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you click that icon, you can type in your question and click send to submit. If you want to submit anonymously, there is a way to push a button and do that. We'll uh, be accepting questions up until the last two minutes of the Q&A session. Also, during the webinar, I'll be monitoring the Q&A, and so I may answer your questions directly in the Q&A, or we may decide to answer them live with our presenters. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to our program manager, Elizabeth Olson, whose email is on the slide today. And without further ado, introducing today's event. So we put the agenda in the chat. Feel free to take a look at that. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers. 
there's me, again, Medical Director, California Prevention Training Center. I'm not gonna spend time on that, but instead I get to introduce the wonderful Dr. Ina Park. Dr. Park is the Principal Investigator at the California Prevention Training Center. She's a professor in the Departments of Family and Community Medicine, as well as OBGYN at the University of California, San Francisco. And in addition, she's a medical consultant in the Division of STD Prevention for the CDC. She's a co-author of the 2021 CDC STI Treatment Guidelines, and she's also the author of a really great book called Strange Bedfellows, which you can see on the slide here. I will now stop my screen share and turn it over to Dr. Park. Thank you all again so much for being here. Thanks, Kelly, for that introduction. Let's see if I can get the tech right here and actually share my slides. Let's see. So far, so good. How's that looking? That looks perfect. Okay, fantastic. I'm so, I'm, that's already a win that we got the, sh the slides to share. Yeah. So um, Ina Park, thank you so much, Kelly, for that lovely introduction. And I'm here to do, I think, you know, not the most sexy part of the talk, but it's to go over the epidemiology of STIs in general, a little bit and, and focus on syphilis. And I did want to add that because this is a collaboration with the Phoenix IHS, we are focusing, um, you know, on Arizona data, but I think that those of you who are on the call from other IHS sites, and welcome, by the way, um, we'll see that there are lots of parallels to what might be going on um, in your centers as well. So I just wanted to take a minute to reflect, um, why are we here? And I think as I get further along in my career, and right now I have more years you know, behind me than I do ahead of me, you know, why am I here? what is my purpose? And, you know, I was thinking about that last night in terms of why we are all gathering here, you know, for this webinar. And I think we acknowledge that syphilis and especially congenital syphilis is an enormous issue. You know, it's a tragedy because this is a completely preventable infection. And I think all of us are here, hopefully, because we want to take a deeper dive and have a greater understanding of this infection and as well, you know, I think getting into these sort of activities where we are coming together and discussing this together, I think then slowly begins to build this sort of community of allies. And we are all sort of, you know, bonding together against this common foe, which is congenital syphilis. And I think we all can agree, even though we, lots of things we can't agree on in this world that, you know, one baby who dies from syphilis is, you know, definitely one baby too many. So mostly I just want to thank you all for being here. I looked at the participant list extensively before this webinar, and we have, you know, folks that are administrative staff and clinicians and mental health professionals and nursing staff and nursing assistants. And I think it reflects that we all need to come together, not one organization, um, not one type of provider, not one type of person is going to be able to solve this issue. And by the way, I also see that our contact tracers, um, some of us are, some of them are on this um, webinar as well. So we all certainly need to bond together. And so thank you for being here. But I just wanted to point out that this, you know, the setting of where we're at right now is that you know, STIs were already on the increase before the pandemic, and we had a little reprieve during the shelter in place, but it's primarily because, you know, for a short, for a minute, people stopped having sex, and many sites, uh, including the site where I see patients, stopped doing any screening of asymptomatic folks. So we had a pretty sharp decline in cases of chlamydia that hasn't quite um, caught up. And so you will see that if we look over the past five years from the time that CDC published these data, there's been a 5% decline in chlamydia. Now, do I really think that that, you know, is actually happening? Probably not. And I think when screening is fully ramped up again, um, we'll see chlamydia bounce right back up. But, you know, interestingly, gonorrhea and syphilis continue to climb during the COVID-19 pandemic after a very brief, like three to four month dip. And then you'll see that, especially for syphilis, which is the focus of this talk, that we've had a 68% increase in the five years before CDC published these data, and almost a 200% increase in congenital syphilis. And don't get attached to this number, by the way, of congenital syphilis cases, because it is actually significantly worse in 2022. 
the most common question that I get asked whenever I give a talk on STIs is why? Why is this happening? And I think the answer varies depending on which community we come from. And then I also think that there is no one answer for why this is happening in every community, but it's actually a confluence of multiple factors. So, you know, looking at um, men who have sex with men, as well as the LGBTQ plus community in general, I think a huge issue um, that has affected the rise of STIs is actually the rise of HIV treatment and prevention. I think there's a lot less fear around HIV, which is a wonderful thing because now we have highly effective treatment, which has been around since 1996. And now we have folks you know, living with HIV who have undetectable viral loads who are not able to pass HIV sexually to partners. And then of course, many of you have heard of HIV PrEP, which was um, approved in July of 2012. And now there are three different medications that can be used for PrEP. Lots of my folks, uh, patients I see who are HIV negative are using PrEP and therefore not using condoms. So that is certainly a factor I think in the rise in STIs. And then of course, you know, we love to throw Tinder and other apps under the bus. Um, mobile hookup apps are plentiful. And what they've done is re really facilitated people finding sex you know, quickly and um, efficiently. And patients have said it's like harder to order takeout than to find sex online. And so you can imagine that that obviously facilitates um, hookups, it uh, facilitates, you know, potentially mixing of sexual networks and then possibly STIs as well. And then, you know, just to, I don't mean to pick on Grindr at all. There's, you know, many, many apps where they're all trying to do similar things where, you know, it geolocates where you are and where potential partners are. And, um, you know, in Grindr, for example, you can select what sexual practices you're into, what your HIV status is, whether or not actually um, you are taking HIV prep, as well as like what sexual role, whether or not if for anal sex, you might be the, um, you know, insertive partner or the receptive partner. And there's, you know, enormous reach from these apps, much more than any one health department, for example, might be able to do in terms of reaching uh, potential clients. So, you know, we're up against a lot in the field of STIs. And then I want to focus, you know, because we are talking about syphilis and congenital syphilis is that here um, where I'm sitting in the West, as well as, you know, Arizona, which is co-sponsoring uh, this event is that substance use and addiction is actually a huge issue. And I'm going to show you a few slides related to this. But if we can think about them as sort of overlapping epidemics or syndemics, you know, the epidemic of syphilis and congenital syphilis and substance use um, is, you know, sort of well understood and described. And so, you know, to, in order for a baby to have syphilis, the, you know, a woman of reproductive age has to get syphilis first. And this is looking at CDC data. Unfortunately, it's a little bit older and it hasn't been updated, but yet, but it will be. And I just want to point out for primary and secondary syphilis, which you'll learn more about actually in future talks, which are our most infectious, you know, uh, stages of syphilis in terms of passing on to partners, you'll see that sex while intoxicated or high was reported by over a third of women with um, these really infectious stages of syphilis. And then, you know, as we talked about, sex with anonymous partners has is also, you know, quite high. Lower down on the list is sex with a person who injects drugs. That's what PWID means. And then, of course, there's exchange sex um, for drugs and sometimes, as you know, for shelter, food, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, a small minority, you know, about 5% actually report that they have sex with men who also, you know, may identify as bisexual or also have sex with men and women. But you'll see, as I mentioned, substance use is a huge factor playing um, into the syphilis epidemic in, um, in females. And crystal methamphetamine, so we all know about the opioid epidemic in the United States, but around syphilis, crystal methamphetamine is actually a huge issue. And um, here where I'm sitting in the West, used to be over a third of cases of uh, women with syphilis reported using crystal meth. That's actually went down in 20, that went down in 2020. I haven't seen the new data. I'd be very curious to see what happened during the pandemic and afterwards. But we certainly know that opioid overuse death 
um, opioid um, use deaths are, are increased. And so I'd be curious to see how um, methamphetamine and syphilis will be interacting in future data presentations by CDC. And then contrast to um, you know, the South and Northeast where it's not as much of an issue. And then the Midwest is somewhere in between. So now I'm moving into um, some more recent data. In November of 2023, the CDC actually put out a report, it's called Vital Signs, and it's talking about the um, increase in syphilis in newborns. I highly recommend that you check it out. This is a graphic from the um, release, and you'll see that there's been a tenfold increase in the past 10 years. Um, so now we're up, you know, I said earlier, don't get attached to that number of congenital syphilis cases because it's actually more than a thousand cases higher than it was um, in 2021. It's uh, 3,761 cases. And when we look at the reasons for why that's happening and sort of dissect you know, what we could do as folks who work in, in the field and take care of some of us who take care of patients is that timely testing and treatment during pregnancy might have prevented almost all of these cases in 2022. And I'm actually going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into that and talk specifically about American Indian and Alaska Native communities when it comes to testing and treatment gaps. So, you know, I think CBS put it well that it's it's heartbreaking and I, it really is. I mean, this is one of those issues that I think is really uh, difficult and disturbing for all of us who work in this field. So the vital signs report has, you know, some really great flow charts and graphs. Here's one of them. And it's just, you know, I think kind of self-explanatory in a sense that as primary and secondary syphilis increases among females and folks, you know, who can become pregnant, then you'll see that in the blue line. And naturally as that increases, congenital syphilis is also going to increase. And I'm sorry, this is not in the vital signs report because this is one year behind in terms of data, but I did want to point out, and I think everybody on this call likely knows that there are huge differences in rates by race, ethnicity, and folks serving, you know, American Indian and Alaska Native communities will know that the rates of congenital syphilis are substantially higher than in other racial ethnic groups. And let's just look at the slope of the curve and how quickly that that is increasing. And so I think our goal is really to try to flatten that curve um, as much as possible. And then you'll see, I think the you know group that's next sort of most highly affected is um, Pacific Islander, Native Hawaiian. So NH and PI means Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander followed by Black and African American and then Hispanic Latino. Now this is national data, and obviously um, in, in Arizona, who's collaborating on this webinar with us, you know, it looks different because of the racial ethnic makeup of their population being different. So another thing in the Vital Signs report that I um, would, you know, encourage you all to look at is uh, a flow chart looking at what are the missed opportunities around testing and treatment, and that first kind of uh, row of uh, boxes is really around testing, either not testing or not testing in a timely way, or having someone develop syphilis and then identifying it late because of the way testing happened. And then the next set of boxes is looking at timely and adequate testing and tr um, timely and adequate treatment. And you'll see that the two boxes in the blue reflect, you know, a large proportion of people who either don't get treated adequately or um, don't have any treatment documented at all. And then I, I, you know, I'm not gonna spend time going over every single percentage because I actually wanna focus, um, given the folks that we we're talking with today, on um, this box over here in the second row, which is no, non-timely or no documented test. And I just wanted to point out that um, about half or 47% of congenital syphilis cases among American Indian and Alaska Native women um, is related to either non-timely testing or no documented test. So the national um, average is 36.8, but among American Indian and Alaska Native women, it's almost half. And then that is true also for uh, Hawaiian and Pacific Islander women, it's actually 60%. And for white women, it's very similar to um, American Indian women. 
But that's in contrast to um, Black, African-American, and Hispanic women where actually inadequate treatment is the primary issue. So there are differences by racial ethnic group. But for the folks here on this call, you know, really um, testing is the major prevention gap. I also would invite you to look at Arizona, the state of Arizona, for those of you who work in Arizona, um, annual, um, annual report was published also in November of 2023. And uh, they point out that Arizona did have the highest rate of congenital syphilis in the US with a rate of 237 for 100,000 live births and compared to the US rate of 78. So it's a great report, lots of really good information there. The other thing I wanted to draw your attention to was they have this really great interactive dashboard um, on their website, which is very easily found on search engine. And you can then toggle over the year of data that you're interested in and which infection that you are interested in that they do surveillance on. And then you can look at breakdowns by gender, um, race, ethnicity. And I find it really helpful, very easy to use and very interactive. And so um, you'll see, I'm going to focus in on this, is that, you know, they have data on the dashboard up until 2023, August. And you'll notice that if you look at the dark red line for 2022 and this pink line for 2023, that you will see less cases overall in 2023 compared to the same times in 2022. But I just want to point out a caveat that the 2023 data are not yet finalized. Something else that, you know, our colleagues at the Arizona Department of Health Services actually provided to us just yesterday, so very hot off the press, is looking at the stages of syphilis in Arizona. And I just want to point out, um, you know, some major take-home points here is that you'll see that the lighter colored pink and red bars represent those early cases of syphilis that, um, especially like the light pink, and then this uh, darker pink and then the lighter red represent those that are primary, secondary, and then early latent syphilis. Those are all cases of um, syphilis who've had the infection for less than a year. And then those darker red bars represent late latent syphilis or syphilis when we don't know the duration of how long the infection is. And those thin navy bars on the end are congenital syphilis cases. So all I want you to notice is that first of all, 2023 does have less cases so far. Um, the data again are not totally complete and closed out, but you will notice that there's about half, you know, of the cases are those early cases, and about half are late cases. And so, from a public health standpoint, we worry from uh, like transmission amongst partners, and we were worried the most about uh, primary and secondary syphilis. But I'm going to say that in pregnancy. In pregnancy, because you know the baby is receiving circulation directly from the mother, that you can pass syphilis to a baby at any of these stages of syphilis. So more syphilis in general, even if it's you know late syphilis and latent syphilis with no symptoms, does put us at risk of having more congenital syphilis cases because syphilis can be transmitted at any stage during pregnancy. And then Arizona also has, on a different part of their website, um, a dashboard of syphilis just in females because they're obviously really focused on reducing their rates. And so they have 10 months of data up there. And I just wanted to point out that they are keeping tabs on the number of cases as well as um, the number of partners that they were able to find and treat. And you guys can see just right here, right, that we have 2,300 cases and a very small percentage were actually uh, you know, had successful contact tracing and partners were able to be treated. But they do estimate that they prevented as many cases of syphilis in babies as actually occurred. So 177 prevented and 177 cases. And then for in terms of stillbirths and um, deaths of babies in the first 30 days of life, there have been 16 so far in 2023. And just to you know, give you an idea. In 2021, when we saw that report of Arizona having the highest rates of congenital syphilis, they had 14 uh, deaths, stillbirths and deaths that year, and 16 in 2023. So I expect maybe a few more in the last few months. 
And then finally, um, I just want to point out um, and again, thank our colleagues at the Arizona Department of Health Services is that there are racial and ethnic differences. And I don't need you guys to focus so heavily on the actual numbers in these bar charts. But I did want to point out that the largest sort of proportion of cases just by the numbers is actually among Hispanic and Latino populations in Arizona. And remember, we mentioned that obviously every state is going to have a little bit of a different distribution based on the racial ethnic makeup of their um, of their population. But you'll see that La Hispanic Latinos have the greatest share. And then the dark green bars on the top represent the American Indian and Alaska Native uh, communities. And so, you know, you'll see that in the state of Arizona, at least, that we have a large representation of the cases, a majority of the cases in those two populations alone. And then, you know, less so in Black and African American and then other race ethnicities. So again, 2023 cases do look a little bit lower, but um, those case counts are not yet final. So we'll have to wait to see what Arizona publishes on that front. Okay, so I just wanna summarize you know, some of the things that we talked about, we all saw that national trends in congenital syphilis are increasing and they are driven by gaps in maternal testing and treatment. And remember that the gaps in testing were um, prim the primary issue for American Indian Alaska Native populations, whites and Pacific Islanders, and then gaps in treatment, primarily inadequate treatment, were the issue for Black and Lat uh, Hispanic Latino populations. And so Arizona did have the highest rates of congenital syphilis in the US in 2021. Hopefully that will not be the case for 2022 and 2023. And then in general in the US um, that Alaska, American Indian Alaska native populations are suffering the highest rates of congenital syphilis. And then here in the Western region, syphilis and females and substance use are you know, overlapping epidemics or syndemics. And then, you know, when we looked at Arizona adult syphilis data, and that included syphilis of all stages, um, Native American and Alaska Native populations and Hispanic Latino adults had the highest share of adult syphilis cases in the state of Arizona. So I'm actually going to end on time, which I'm very proud of myself. I just want to acknowledge some folks that shared their slides uh, for this talk. Oh, by the way, this is me and my clinic in um, the STD clinic in San Francisco. And this is the healthy penis, which is a costume that goes around to different events and promotes syphilis testing among uh, men who have sex with men. I wanna thank Heidi Bauer who provided some of the slides for the early part of this talk, um, our colleagues at Arizona Department of Health Services and our liaison from IHS, Emily, I hope it's Tehi. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. And then Caitlin Huffstetter from CDC who provided some of the CDC data slides. And again, I want to acknowledge and thank everyone who's here today who is caring about syphilis enough to learn more. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague and my STI fellow, Wyatt Hamp, um, who is a first generation college student who did his undergrad and medical training at the University of California at Davis. He is very passionate about reproductive justice as well as LGBTQIA plus healthcare. And so he um, did his degree in public health at UC Berkeley and has studied reproductive health policy. He's also an abortion provider. And at UCSF, he's also, um, you know, finished a residency in family and community medicine and is now our STI fellow. And so I'm very excited to turn this over to him. And thank you all again. Thank you, Ina. Um, let me share my screen with you all. And okay, are you all able to see that pretty well? Looks good. Great. Um, thank you, Ina, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and today I'll be um, giving you all a introduction to syphilis with a syphilis one hundred and one talk, um, and which will hopefully give you a good foundation as we continue to talk more about syphilis in pregnancy, as well as congenital syphilis in later talks. Uh -huh. uh, just to start with a few learning objectives, um, I'm hoping you take a good, away a good understanding 
of the pathophysiology and natural history of syphilis infection. We learned to recognize symptoms of primary, secondary, and neurosyphilis. We learned to distinguish early and late latent syphilis. Um, learned to describe the traditional as well as reverse screening algorithms for syphilis testing and how we use them, <clears throat> as well as understand CDC recommendations for stage-based syphilis treatments and follow-up. Um, and just as a kind of heads up, um, uh, because we have two discussions on syphilis and pregnancy as well as congenital syphilis, uh, the case I will be presenting to you all um, as well as many of the photos um, involve persons with male anatomy. Um, and that's just because we'll have exposure to um, other types of people later in other presentations. So I want you to have a good variety of what you see. What you see. Um, and I have no financial disclosures. Um, and um, throughout this presentation, we'll be going through a case. Um, and this case is um, uh, something that was sent to us. So it hopefully is something that you all recognize as um, uh, um, something you might see in uh, your clinical settings or um, uh, the patients you uh, uh, work with. Um, and uh, the purpose of this case is really to see how syphilis can present and how it can go um, untreated even when somebody is presenting to care, uh, which is part of the reason we're seeing such um, uh, drastic in, uh, increases in numbers. Um, so to start with this case, and this is something I'll visit later in the presentation too. <clears throat> uh, this is a 25-year-old male who presents to urgent care with the complaint of a spot on his privates. It started about two weeks ago and is mildly painful. His last sexual encounter was three months ago and with a female coworker who is married to another person and is now five weeks pregnant. She is the only sexual partner that he has had in the last six months and he'd prefer not to involve her if possible because she is married to somebody else and they are currently pregnant. You do an exam, and this is what you see on exam. I'll describe it to you as a single ulcerative lesion uh, with a clean base and some surrounding erythema. And it's hard to really tell what definition there is, but you might imagine it has some raised edges. <clears throat> and so we'll do, be doing a few polling questions throughout this presentation. Um, and this is the first of those, and uh, that is, what do you think the most likely diagnosis is? Possible uh, answers include genital herpes, chancroid, primary syphilis, syphilis, and Bassett syndrome. We'll wait a few, um, a little while for you all to provide answers. And I think we could, I can't actually see how many people responded, but yeah, I think we could close the poll. And uh, awesome. It looks like the majority of us answer primary syphilis, uh, which is um, the thing I want you to be most worried about in this setting. Um, I think all of these are reasonable things to keep on your differential diagnosis. Um, but the point of this question actually isn't to trick you we are talking about syphilis today, um, but to uh, um, inform you that many things can look like syphilis and that syphilis, and when you have an ulcerative lesion, especially on the genitals, but even any part of the body, um, it should be on your differential. Um, and so I'll go through each of these uh, other diagnoses and show you uh, why we would not consider this most consistent with um, those diagnoses um, a little bit later on in the presentation. But this is how a primary syphilis uh, case might present. Um, and as I mentioned, syphilis can look like many things, and so it's very commonly misdiagnosed. Um, and uh, this is just an example of how that could happen. This provider suspects that HS, um, this patient has HSV2 or genital herpes, and prescribes a course of acyclovir, and the provider recommends he disclose the diagnosis to his partner, the one who's currently married and pregnant. Um, but says that she would only need treatment if symptoms develop during pregnancy. Um, and so we have seen a patient um, with primary syphilis. And so I want to discuss primary syphilis, syphilis with you. Um, and that's actually starting with 
um, a general overview of syphilis so we have a good foundation. Uh, so syphilis is caused by Trypanema pallidum, which is a spirochete bacterium, and it's transmitted through direct contact with infectious lesions. It can also be bloodborne as well as transmitted from mother to child or vertically, um, as we'll learn in future presentations. And the incubation period on average is three to four weeks, but can range up to 90 days. So it's really important to inquire about uh, possible uh, exposures up to 90 days ago, um, as patients might not spontaneously bring that up or even think about it. Um, and the bacterium causes a systemic infection with episodes of active disease interrupted by periods of latent infection. <laughs> um, here on the right, we have a diagram of kind of the life cycle of syphilis. You can see it enters the body uh, through the site of inoculation. Commonly, that's the genitals, but it can be actually any site of the body, as we'll learn in uh, a few slides. And it then enters the body through um, the lymphatic system to infect the rest of the body. Um, this is a diagram of the natural history of syphilis and going through all of the stages we might encounter, as well as those complications. Um, and just to remind you, this is a disease that's um, characterized by stages of active infection, uh, which are primary and secondary syphilis with symptoms. Um, then interrupted by stages of latent disease uh, or asymptomatic disease, um, which is early or late um, latent disease. And so we'll go through each of those stages with you um, to discuss more. There are complications that can happen at any stage of syphilis. That includes neurosyphilis, ocular syphilis, and otosyphilis, which I'll discuss very briefly at the end of this presentation. And then, at, we'll, as we'll discuss in uh, future presentations, Congenital syphilis um, and transmission to the pregnancy can happen at any stage as well. Um, and if a pregnancy goes untreated, that is, there's an 80% chance of that happening. But again, we just saw a patient with primary syphilis. So I wanted to start um, with primary syphilis on the left of this diagram. You can see after exposure, 30 to 50% of those people move on to develop an infection. Um, and again, the incubation period is on average three to four weeks, but can be up to 90 days. And primary infection is characterized by an, uh, an ulcer or an ulcerative in, uh, disease. And the ulcer is typically called a chancre. This is usually a single painless, indurated, clean base lesion with raised rolled edges. Um, and because it's painless and often in sites that we can't easily see, it can very easily go unrecognized. Sometimes people have regional lymphadenopathy, such as annual lymphadenopathy, uh, but typically not generalized lymphadenopathy. <laughs> um, while this is the typical presentation, atypical ulcers, uh, there can be multiple of them, um, and they can also be slightly painful, as we saw in our patient case. I wanted to show you some examples of typical and atypical um, shankers um, or primary syphilis cases. Um, you can see the top left and right as well as the middle bo bottom are very good examples of that single um, uh, single clean based lesion with kind of raised edges that are rolled. Um, atypically, again, you can see multiple lesions. Uh, the top middle perianal rash is a really good example of that, um, as well as this uh, bottom right um, uh, rash on the uh, shaft of the penis. And you can imagine how both of those would be very easily confused with genital herpes. And here we just have another example of why of a peri um, perianal lesion and why this would be so hard to recognize for a patient. And as I mentioned before, you can have um, extra genital shankers. Um, it happens at any site of inoculation. So we, here we have an example of a, a lingual or a, a tongue shanker, a digit, as well as two facial lips. And I wanted to go over the kind of there are other things that can cause ulcerative um, disease, especially including the genitalia. Um, here are some examples of that, although this is not an exhaustive list. Um, HSV would be a common misdiagnosis for syphilis. Um, typically, HSV starts with a very painful um, vesicular rash, uh, usually on kind of an erythematous base, as you can see here. And then that usually erodes into a uh, ulcerative rash, as you can see here. <clears throat> um, similar to syphilis, you can have extra genital sites of HSV. Here's an example of Whitlow finger, 
um, which is just an infection on the finger. And then HSV-1 commonly causes uh, cold sores or um, labial infections. Um, another diagnosis is chancroid, which could be confusing or confused with syphilis. Um, this is another ulcerative disease, and this is caused by Haemophilus duprii. And uh, typically, these ulcers are extremely painful. There's associated lymphadenopathy, and even that lymphadenopathy can ulcerate as well. So those are some distinguishing factors. An autoimmune cause for um, ulcerative disease, including the genitalia, is Bassett syndrome. Um, uh, and uh, um, as you can see here, you can have um, uh, ulceration uh, essentially at any mucosal site, but here's an example of the mouth as well as the penis. Um, uh, regarding the uh, penile ulcer, this is, has more ragged edges and is more shallow in appearance, um, so slightly different than what you would see with syphilis, but it could be easily confused. So going back to our patient and this case, uh, remember, they were um, initially presented with that penile ulcer um, and were misdiagnosed with HSV2. But now they're returning to urgent care six weeks later with a non-paritic full body rash. <clears throat> they deny any exposures, um, including pets, travel, medication, and detergents. And he had a tactile fever a few days ago, but otherwise has felt well. Um, he has no new sexual encounters. And so you do an exam and on the torso, as well as the upper extremities, um, you see this macular, a diffuse macular papular rash. Um, and then you look at the hands and you see uh, what I would describe is um, a few uh, erythematous macules, um, small erythematous macules with overlying uh, scale. And so another question for you all is, what is the most likely diagnosis? Possible answers include viral exanthem, scabies, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, erythema multiforme, or secondary syphilis. We'll give you, I'm going to say 20 seconds for that, just because I don't want to go over on time. Great, uh, amazing response rate, um, 82. And almost all of you um, um, knew the correct answer, which is secondary syphilis. And that is um, certainly what we are most concerned for. Um, but again, um, rashes like this um, can be very easily um, misdiagnosed, um, which is what the example I'm giving you here. Uh, so we're concerned about secondary syphilis. But unfortunately, the provider suspects a viral exanthem uh, given the patient's recent febrile illness. They provide reassurance and instruct the patient to apply moisturizers and topical hydrocortisone if it becomes itchy. And they counsel uh, that the rash should improve without further treatment. Again, um, this isn't going to trick you, but it's really to say that these rashes are very commonly misdiagnosed and it often happens and it's um, very easy to do. So it's really important to keep syphilis on your differential um, for uh, many situations. So uh, we have now had a patient come to us with secondary syphilis. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that returning to this natural history. And um, so our patient had primary syphilis. Our patient goes through exposure, primary syphilis, usually two to six weeks after primary syphilis. Somebody develops symptoms of secondary syphilis. Most commonly, that is a rash, which is typically generalized. And uh, characteristically, it can involve the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, um, uh, though not always. Additionally, patients can have generalized lymphadenopathy, constitutional symptoms such as headaches, myalgias, um, fevers, um, mucus patches, condylomalata, and patchy alopecia, all of which I'll review in just a moment. And so here are really good examples of the rash you can see with secondary syphilis. Again, it's typically generalized, so you'll see it on the torso. Um, and it, commonly it has an overlying scale, which you can see in both of these examples. Um, and it, <clears throat> um, characteristically, it involves the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, um, as you can see in these two examples. 
And for those with darker skin pigmentation, especially when there's um, only sparse and not so numerous um, um, macules, um, it can be very easily confused with scarring. So it's really important to um, have a broad differential that includes syphilis. And uh, this testicular rash is also a good example of that overlying scale that you see. Again, this is typically not itchy. Um, so that's important to, to know. Um, and uh, again, this rash can be very easily misdiagnosed and confused for other things. My purpose here is not to overwhelm you with a differential diagnosis, um, but really to show you other types of rashes um, that are um, currently misdiagnosed when syphilis is actually uh, the true cause. Um, we have things such as tinea versicolor, which is a fungal infection, um, measles, skewies, uh, meningococcemia or meningococcal bacteremia, uh, Rocky Mountain, Mountain spotted fever, as well as bacterial endocarditis can result in uh, hand lesions or Janeway lesions. Um, those are infectious causes that can be very easily misdiagnosed. Um, we have some autoimmune causes, um, such as palmal plantar eczema, uh, erythema multiforme, um, guttate psoriasis, which commonly happens with after a streptococcal infection. Um, you have mobiliform drug reactions, which can happen uh, one to two weeks after starting a medication. Um, and then um, pityriasis rosea, also commonly associated with a previous viral infection. Uh, so again, these are just examples um, of things that could be um, confused for syphilis um, or be confused rather than syphilis, uh, diagnosed rather than syphilis. So it's, again, really important to keep that broad differential. Um, and this is also a really good example of why we describe syphilis as the kind of great masquerader. It can look like many things. Um, here are examples of mucus patches, again, another symptom of secondary syphilis. Uh, these are commonly um, raised, kind of whitish, clear patches um, on the uh, um, uh, mucosal surfaces of the mouth. Um, you can see three really good examples here. Um, and this is an example on the uh, uh, mucosal surface of the lip, and a little bit harder to see. Um, mucus patches can be easily misdiagnosed or um, uh, thought to be different something else. Here's an example of oropharyngeal candidiasis, which is um, a yeast infection of the oropharynx, commonly seen in severe immunosuppression. Um, uh, this is uh, easily movable if you take a Q-tip to it. So if it comes off, um, it's more likely to be candidiasis and not a mucus patch. Um, and then uh, oral hairy leukoplakia looks very similar to mucus patches, also seen in severe immunosuppression and is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, characteristically, it has some kind of vertical striation to it, though I wouldn't rely on that for diagnosis, of course. Um, but these are just examples of what that could be misdiagnosed as. Uh, here are examples of patchy alopecia. Um, some um, textbooks might describe this as having a, a mothy in appearance, just because it looks kind of uh, patchy like a mothy in uh, clothing. Um, and it could be confused with things such as um, alopecia areata. Um, this can also include the eyebrows. Um, here are examples of condyloma lata, not to be confused with condyloma cumulata, which I'll describe shortly. Um, these are um, uh, kind of raised, sessile, or flat um, lesions, usually in the mucosal surface or the warm, wet areas, sorry, warm, wet areas of the body, such as the uh, perianal, perineal, and uh, perivulvar areas. Here are three really good examples of perianal rashes. You'll see some perivulval rashes or perivulval condylomalata in future presentations. Um, and these can be painful just because they become macerated um, and they are uh, very infectious. Uh, this is not to be confused with uh, um, genital warts or HPV, or which is caused by HPV. Typically, these have a more uh, cauliflower like appearance, uh, which you can see here is a really good example. And here is an example of that kind of cauliflower-like appearance on the penile shaft. But again, if you have somebody with um, uh, warts or kind of raised lesions in the genital or perianal area, it's important to think broadly and include syphilis on your diagnosis or differential. And so that's secondary syphilis. I now want to return to our patient with part three of this case. 
Uh, this patient establishes care with a new PCP three years after his last urgent care appointment. Remember, he never received appropriate treatment. He feels well and has no complaints. Um, he was briefly incarcerated for drug-related charges last year. His, um, he's had two to three partners over the last few months, both male and female, and he'd like whichever labs you would recommend. And so what STI screens, or what STIs do you screen for, given this patient's history? We'll give you, I'm gonna say 10 seconds for this. Awesome, amazing response rate. And um, everyone was correct. Um, all of the above is what we would screen for. Um, and uh, just given this patient's history of having both male and female partners, as well as recent incarceration and substance use, um, those are all things that would um, make us want to screen for these things. Additionally, he's never had screening. So um, as an adult male, that was something else um, you might want to think about. Uh, so the provider does screen for gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, and syphilis, and the patient's labs return with a non-reactive RPR and a reactive TPPA. All other labs were non-reactive, and the provider suspects the TPPA is a false positive. Uh, my question for you is, do you agree with this provider? Uh, possible answers include, yes, this is a false positive. No, this could be an old infection, or this is an old infection uh, that may or not may not have been treated. And C, uh, maybe, but I want to ask more questions and do more testing. Uh, we can give you a few minutes, seconds for this. And when you're answering this, I want you to think of this patient as if you were this provider and you've never met them before, not necessarily like we know their entire history as we do. Great. Um, so the, we have a little bit of a split between B and C, but more with C. And C is actually the correct answer in this case. And we'll get more into why in just a second. But again, we do know this patient's history. So it might be very easy to be like, no, of course, this is a false positive, um, And we want to treat this like an old infection. But the answer in this case is it could be a false positive. Um, or sorry, no, this is an old infection. Uh, this could be an old infection, but it can also be a false positive. So we actually do want to ask more questions and learn more about this patient. And I'll go into why that is in just a minute. Um, and my last question for you all today is, if we ultimately diagnose this patient with syphilis, what stage would they have? Your answers include primary, secondary, early latent, late latent, and tertiary. A little bit unfair because I haven't talked about a few of these, but um, think about this patient and the course that we've seen them go through. Amazing. So we have a little bit of a split, but um, mostly early and late um, latent. Uh, the answer in this case is late latent syphilis. So regardless of even if we knew this patient um, or didn't know this patient, um, uh, they would be diagnosed with um, late latent syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration. Um, we'll go into kind of how we differentiate um, early and late latent in just a minute. Uh, but because this patient has had an infection and it's been more than one year, um, it would be late latent syphilis. Um, and so this provider gives, because they misdiagnosed the patient and uh, um, they misinterpreted the labs, they give the uh, patient a clear bill of health to tell him to follow up in one year for his annual exam. Again, this isn't to provide you um, with what not to do. This is really to provide you with an example of how this can go wrong um, and it, how it commonly does go wrong. Um, and so um, hopefully you can take away um, um, that from this story. And uh, now I wanna talk a little bit about latent syphilis since we just saw a patient with latent syphilis. Again, a uh, patient goes through exposure, develops primary and secondary symptoms commonly. Um, and then after that, so they go into a phase of latent disease and this is asymptomatic disease. So they don't have any outward symptoms that we can recognize. 
Um, and we categorize latent disease into early latent and late latent or unknown duration, um, and mostly for treatment purposes too. Early latent is any infection that has occurred within the last 12, 12 months or for which we have evidence of it occur occurring within the last 12 months. Um, if it doesn't have evidence of occurring within the last 12 months, then it's considered late latent or unknown duration. And so what is evidence of occurrence or evidence of infection within the last 12 months? Um, so if in the last year they have had negative syphilis serology and say it's new, newly positive, um, they have a known contact with early syphilis, they've had signs or symptoms of primary or secondary syphilis, this was that shinker or that rash that I mentioned. Um, they have a previous um, titer that has had a fourfold increase or they only have one exposure within the last, one possible exposure and it's been within the last one year. If any of those things have occurred within the last year, then it can be considered early syphilis and that's evidence of early syphilis. If none of those things have occurred, then we consider it lately in syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration. So um, we've talked about staging for syphilis, specifically primary, secondary, early and late latent. So I wanna go into diagnosis with you all. The gold standard for diagnosis is either direct swab or PCR swab of a lesion or um, a dark field microscopy. And unfortunately, those things are not widely available. So we rely on um, serologies. Serologies can be split into two categories, including non-triplenemal tests and treplenemal tests. For non-triplenemal tests, we have RPR and VDRL. These are quantitative tests that allow for assessment of disease burden, treatment adequacy, and reinfection, um, but they're not specific. So they uh, can be positive in other uh, settings. Um, some examples include autoimmune disease. We then have treponemal tests, which direct, uh, de <clears throat> detect antibodies that are specific to uh, treponemal pallidum. Some examples of that include TPPA, TPHA, FD antibodies, ETA, and CIA. And um, these antibodies usually stay positive for life after initial infection, and they're not quantitative, or these tests are not quantitative. And so for these reasons, it cannot be used uh, to assess for reinfection or response to treatments. And for diagnosis purposes, it's actually really important to have both a positive non-triplenemal test and a triplenemal test um, for diagnosis. Um, there are few caveats to that, which I'll go over in just a second. But typically, we want both a positive RPR or VDRL as well as a positive treponemal test. Um, something I find very helpful for understanding how to interpret titers is understanding how they change over time with and without treatment. And that's actually what this graph here is showing. Um, and starting with treponemal tests, remember these stay positive forever. So after an initial infection, we'll see this dotted blue line, uh, the treponemal antibodies um, increase and they then continue to stay positive. Um, and so regardless of treatment, uh, they will remain positive. And for this reason, they're used to identify history of syphilis, but they're not um, very helpful in uh, discerning past or current infection or treatment success. We then have non-triponemal tests, which again, uh, will fluctuate over time with treatments um, or even without treatments. You can see here that uh, this black line, um, the non-treponemal titer increases in the primary and secondary stages of syphilis, and then will by itself actually start to decrease, uh, but with treatment will decrease more rapidly. And because it does decrease over time and can reach lower levels, um, it, it, is, it is helpful for discerning uh, or identifying active infection, um, as well as uh, treatment success. Um, let's see. So there are two um, testing algorithms that we use for diagnosis of syphilis, which is this includes the traditional algorithm, as well as the reverse screening algorithm. I'm going to go over both of these with you now, uh, starting with the traditional algorithm. Uh, for the traditional algorithm, again, uh, it starts with a non-triplenemal test, and then for confirmation, we do a treponemal test. Again, um, both a reactive non-treponemal and treponemal test are required for diagnosis of syphilis. <clears throat> and so starting at the top, um, non-treponemal test would be RPR or VDRL. 
if that is negative, the screen typically stops um, and that person is considered unlikely to have syphilis. But if it's positive, we need to do a confirmatory test. Um, and if that is positive, um, then that is confirmation of active syphilis or a past or current infection, sorry. Um, if it's negative, then it's indicative of a likely false positive RPR, which isn't uncommon. As I mentioned, they can be falsely positive in many other conditions. Um, there are situations in which you will have a positive treponemal test and a non-reactive non-treponemal test. Um, an example is if the lab you use doesn't have an automatic reflex um, or doesn't follow this algorithm, maybe you're ordering both at the same time or in parallel, um, and then you end up with a positive treponemal and a negative RPR. Um, there are kind of two things this can indicate. It can either indicate an early infection uh, prior to uh, non treponemal seroconversion, or it can be a prior treated or untreated syphilis infection. And so this is actually the case that we had for our patients earlier. Um, and in this setting, you really wanna get more history and information as well as do more testing. If you're concerned about an, uh, a, uh, a new infection, an early infection, you can repeat an RPR or VDRL in two to four weeks and it should seroconvert. Um, that's indicative of a early infection. Um, if you if that doesn't zero convert, and it's like um, you can also repeat a second treponemal test, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and that's confirmatory of a past infection. If they've never been treated, it's important to treat them. We'll talk about that in just now. Um, so this is the reverse screening algorithm. Um, unlike the traditional algorithm, it starts with a treponemal test, and then we move on to a non-treponemal test. In this case, we start with an amino assay, EIA or CIA. If that's non-reactive, then syphilis is unlikely and the screening typically stops. If that is reactive, again, remember we need both a reactive treponemal and non-treponemal test. So we do for diagnosis, so we move on to the non-treponemal test. If that is reactive, then we have confirmation, confirmation of past or current infection. If that's non-reactive, then we're in this kind of awkward situation of having one positive, one negative, similar to what we had in the previous situation. Um, and because that positive was a treponemal test, what we want to do is actually repeat another treponemal test. Um, and um, it should be different than your initial one. So in, the, in this case, we did an EIA or CIA. So our second treponemal test would be a TPPA, but it could be anything really, uh, as long as it's different than the initial test. If that is non-reactive, then you have two non-reactive tests and your initial reactive EIA or CIA. That means that EIA or CIA is likely false positive um, and syphilis is unlikely. But if it's reactive, again, we're in a situation where this could indicate either early syphilis or prior treated or untreated syphilis. And it's really important to get more history. Um, if early is suspected, then you can repeat a RPR or BDRL. I wanted to go over what titers are and how we interpret them. Um, uh, just because, especially in a history of syphilis, because this can be fairly confusing. Um, so titers in themselves, um, which are RPR and VDRL, are direct measurements of antibody in the serum. So the higher the level or the higher the number, the higher the level of antibody in the serum. Um, and VDRL and RPR are not, um, are not interchangeable. So um, they are not comparable. So if you're getting RPRs on somebody, you should always get RPRs on them to compare. Um, and the same with VDRLs. Um, and uh, when you're looking at somebody with a history of syphilis, it's possible that their RPR um, or VDRL or the titer is positive at low levels. Um, and it's important to know how to interpret changes in that RPR over time. As additionally, we look at changes over time after treatment. And so when we look at changes, um, anything that is a twofold change, which I'll point to here, um, so say this patient was at a one to one and they went up to one to two, that would be a twofold change. So think of multiplying by two. Um, that's considered within the margin of error and not significant. Um, but any change that is fourfold or more, so here's an example of that fourfold or more change, uh, one to one to one to four, or what, if they went from one to one to one to eight, um, that would be an eightfold change, but it's more than one to, uh, than a fourfold change, which is significant. Um, anything that is fourfold or more um, is considered significant. If it is an increase, that's um, concerning for a reinfection. And after treatment, we look for a fourfold change for 
uh, indication of treatment uh, success or adequacy. And uh, since we're talking about testing, I wanted to briefly go through uh, syphilis screening recommendations um, uh, recommend, or by, from the CDC. And starting with men who have sex with women and non-pregnant females, um, there aren't any recommendations on frequency of testing for this group, um, but it's really risk-based. So people who have a history of sex work, uh, incarceration, methamphetamine use, or other STI diagnoses, you could consider testing in. Um, and the frequency really depends on your risk assessment. Uh, for the MSM and MSMW population, um, CDC recommends at least annual testing. Um, and up to every three to six months, depending on sexual behavior. An example of that is a patient who was on PrEP, uh, who you might do a Q three to six month testing. Um, for pregnant females, which we'll learn a lot about in the future, um, so I'm not going to dwell on it, uh, we recommend um, testing at the first prenatal visit for a trimester, as well as at delivery, and um, if they are at increased risk and don't have a negative third trimester screen. <clears throat> Uh, for gender diverse folk, um, the, we recommend you consider uh, annual screening and more frequently depending on sexual behavior. And then for persons living with HIV, um, uh, you should test at first HIV evaluation and then annually, if not more frequently, depending on sexual behavior. And so we've talked about um, staging and diagnosis, so I wanted to review treatment with you all. And uh, treatment for syphilis is based on the stage of disease. And uh, we've reviewed all the stages, including primary, secondary, early latent, and late latent syphilis. Um, just for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to limit it to um, those stages and not tertiary syphilis, um, since it's less commonly seen. And stages, our treatment is really based on the stage, and we group um, primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis into one treatment group, and then late latent syphilis into another. So any infection that occurred within the last year and then past last year. So for primary, secondary, early latent syphilis, um, we recommend, or the recommendation is benzathine penicillin G as a single IM dose of 2.4 million units. <clears throat> and there are alternative regimens, which include doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO for 14 days, tetracycline, 500 milligrams PO for 14 days, as well as ceftriaxone uh, for 10 to 14 days. I want to draw your attention to the different bisillin formulations here to the right. <clears throat> um, as you can see, there's a bisillin CR and a bisillin AL, uh, sorry, LA. The only adequate treatment is bisillin LA, which is the long acting formulation. Bisillin CR is a combination of short and long acting pe uh, penicillin uh, G and is not adequate for treatments. Confusingly, the boxes look nearly identical and they come in the exact same. Um, doses. Um, and as you can see, the syringes look nearly identical as well, other part from the CA or the LA and CR uh, identification. So really important to uh, be cognizant of what either your clinic is purchasing and, or what you're using if you're giving the injection. Um, uh, latent and syphilis, again, this is categorized, or this is this other treatment group. Um, and for late latent syphilis, we recommend the same benzathine and penicillin G, which is BPG or benz uh, bisillin LA, uh, 2.4 million units, but that's given um, in three separate doses over three weeks um, with ideally seven day intervals between injections. Um, the CDC does recognize that, uh, or say it's permissible to provide intervals up to 14 days between injections but really we would like um, to kind of stress that the importance of keeping that seven day interval between injections um, as they are likely the most adequate. Um, and then alternative regimens include doxycycline for 28 days, as well as tetracycline for 28 days. We'll talk a lot about pregnancy, syphilis and pregnancy and congenital syphilis. So I'm not going to discuss that here. Um, and, but I do want to move on to follow up for syphilis um, after somebody is diagnosed and treat, treated. So what's really important is getting a titer on the day of treatment initiation. Um, RPR, VDRL, again, whichever one you are using at your clinic. Um, and I'll discuss why that's really important um, on the next slide. But 
please, please, please get a titer on the day of treatment initiation. And that's regardless of when their last titer was. Um, even if it was two days ago, just get another titer. Um, and it's because titers can change very rapidly. Um, and so as far as follow-up for early syphilis, uh, we recommend you repeat a titer after that day of treatment initiation titer at six months after treatment and 12 months after treatments. For those living with HIV, uh, you do it more frequently at three, six, nine, 12, and 24 months. And you can consider more frequent titers based on risk of reinfection, um, such as a person who was on PrEP um, and getting three months, acute three months titers, that's okay. And what we're looking for for treatment, indication of treatment success is a fourfold decrease in titer over the 12 month period. So by that 12 month follow up, you should see a fourfold decrease. So that it should go from, say, one to one to sixteen to down to one to four. That would be an indication of adequate treatment for late syphilis. Um, so syphilis diagnosed um, that has been existent or um, infection infect, infecting the person for one year or more. Uh, we recommend repeat titers at six, twelve, twenty, and twenty-four months more frequently for those with HIV. <clears throat> um, and you can also consider more frequently for those who are at increased risk and. Adequate treatment is considered a fourfold decrease in titer over that 24 month period. So you're comparing day, day of initiation titer to the 24 month titer. And just stressing the importance of that day of treatment initiation titer. Um, uh, so this is kind of, imagine this being a timeline. Um, this is when you initially see that patient, you get the RPR and say it's one to five, uh, 256. Um, and then uh, we don't usually treat patients the same day. Um, it's not common because we have to wait on the lab to come back. Um, but you call the patient and you say, hey, your titer was increased, come back in for treatment. Um, and say you treat them and uh, you don't get a titer, um, but then they follow up for their six month titer um, or their 12 month titer. Um, and it's still one to 256. Well, it looks like your treatment was not successful. Um, which is um, would be a bummer because it would um, indicate you'd need to treat them again, or maybe they've been reinfected. Um, but if you had gotten a titer on the day of initi treatment initiation, you would have recognized that their titer was actually much higher than it was before, and that you actually have achieved that fourfold decrease. Um, uh, titers can change quite significantly over even a few days which is why um, we recommend getting a, a titer on day of treatment initiation, um, because it's comparing to this titer is how we determine treatment success and it can, uh, establishes the baseline for us. Um, this is frequently forgotten, which is why I'm really stressing this point. Um, and it's hard to really assess treatment adequacy unless we have it. Um, I wanna talk a little bit how we manage contacts to syphilis. As I was mentioning before, uh, patients with early um, earlier stages of syphilis are more infectious. So a sexual contact um, to somebody with early syphilis in the last 90, so wait, sorry, um, a sexual contact who had um, uh, to somebody with early syphilis in the last 90 days should be treated presumptively for early syphilis, regardless of their testing. The reason for this, again, remember that incubation is up to 90 days, so they could develop syphilis kind of regardless of what their serology shows. So if they've um, had contact within the last 90 days, you should treat them. If it's been more than 90 days since their contact with the person with early syphilis, um, then if serology is readily available, get it. And if it's positive, treat them. If it's negative, don't. But if it's not readily available, then you should just treat them presumptively. Um, and then for persons with long-term sex partners who have late latent syphilis, again, this is a less contagious uh, stage of the disease. So you should clinically and serologically evaluate them. And if they are found to have a diagnosis of syphilis, then you should treat them. I wanted to talk briefly, briefly about neurosyphilis. We only have a few minutes um, uh, um, just to put it on your radar. Again, neurosyphilis can occur at any stage of disease. And uh, um, you can also have ocular and otosyphilis. And there's kind of two stages of neurosyphilis. There's early manifestations and late manifestation. Early manifestations include cranial nerve dysfunction, meningitis, stroke, altered mental status. You can get otosyphilis with hearing loss and tinnitus, as well as ocular syphilis with visual changes. There's a large variety of visual symptoms you can have or eye symptoms. Typically, those are unilateral, and typically, ear symptoms are bilateral. Late manifestations happen several decades later, 
later include Cavius Dorsalis as well as General Parisis. Um, the, the thing I really want to stress for you all is that um, anyone who has syphilis can have neurosyphilis, so it's really important to do a thorough neurologic exam on initial diagnosis of syphilis. That includes things such as cranial nerve examination, hearing, vision, strength, um, sensation, and balance assessment. If there are no concerning findings, then you should treat them based on stage, as we discussed previously. If there are concerning findings, this could be an indication of neurosyphilis, and they should have appropriate workup. Typically, we send people to the ED for a lumbar puncture, and that might also include an eye uh, and ear exam. I am not going to go thoroughly into a diagnosis of neurosyphilis, but I do just want to point out that the treatment is different, and that's why it's important to recognize, because if it goes unrecognized and you don't provide an adequate treatment, this could result in treatment failure. Um, the treatment is aqueous crystalline penicillin G, uh, IV for 10 to 14 days. And so uh, that was a rapid review of neurosyphilis. Um, and so just as a summary, syphilis can look like many things. Um, and so you should have a low threshold for testing and screening broadly. Um, neurosyphilis and congenital syphilis can occur at any stage of infection. Uh, serologic diagnosis of syphilis requires reactive treponemal and non treponemal tests. But having only a reactive treponemal test warrants further workup and questioning. And um, treat syphilis depending on the stage of disease. Penicillin is the drug of choice, but there are acceptable alternatives in most cases, excluding pregnancy, which we'll discuss soon. Um, sorry, I went a little bit over, um, but I do want to introduce our next speaker, who is Tamara Ooms. Um, Tamara is a nurse practitioner by training, and she is clinical fac faculty and the program manager, a program manager uh, for the California Pacific Training Center. Uh, Tamara has worked in sexual and reproductive health care um, for over 20 years as a clinician, educator, and administrator. Uh, she is a member of the volunteer faculty at UCSF's uh, School of Nursing, and she provides clinical care um, to patients at a municipal STI clinic in Portland, Oregon, where she currently lives. Tamara, I will pass it over to you. Thank you, Wyatt. Um, appreciate it. Let me get my slides pulled up here. All right, hopefully everyone can see that correctly. All right, so I'm just gonna take a brief moment um, to talk about prevention of syphilis and other STIs. Um, as Dr. Park mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you know, and I think um, others have said this as well, we're thinking whenever we think about syphilis, right, we also need to think about gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HIV. So I'm gonna do a really brief um, presentation about how to think about prevention um, for these four STIs. So really I'm gonna talk about today biomedical, uh, meaning medication to prevent these four infections. So we're gonna primarily talk about this new strategy called, you've probably heard of, got a lot of press last year um, called Doxypep. So this is doxycycline, an antibiotic for bacterial STI prevention. And then we'll briefly talk about HIV post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or HIV PrEP, and then also what's called HIV treatment as prevention or TASP or also known as U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. So this is gonna be kind of a whirlwind. All right, so let's just talk briefly about doxypep. So doxycycline is a tetracycline class of antibiotics and it's in the tetracycline class and it's safe, um, inexpensive and has very few, few side effects, which is why it's a great medication for this purpose. Um, it's used mostly for respiratory skin and soft tissue infections. And it's important to know it is quite active, right? We know this against chlamydia and syphilis. It's not used for gonorrhea. Um, and this is because in the United States, about 20% of gonorrhea samples tested are sh uh, show resistance to doxycycline. There have been three major trials that have shown the effects and effectiveness of doxypep, um, but these have only been, and this is important to remember, in cisgender, meaning men assigned um, men of male at birth, 
and who identify as male. So cisgender men who have sex with men and also transgender women. The DOXY-PEP trial was the major RCT in the United States that was designed specifically to evaluate this new strategy and it received the most press last year. My guess is you heard, um, heard about it on the radio or saw articles about it. Um, but this was this you know, incredibly significant trial because it showed that DOXY-PEP lowered the risk gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis by 65%. Um, so this was really a huge breakthrough in biomedical STI prevention. So what is DOXYPEP? DOXYPEP is taking 200 milligrams of doxycycline within 72 hours, but preferably within 24 hours after condomless oral, anal, or vaginal sex. And like I said, this major RCT shows that this decreases the risk of these three bacterial STIs by 65% in these two specific populations. So how is DOXYPEP prescribed? Um, most of us and most insurance cover 100 milligram pills of doxycycline. For, for most people, this is going to be two pills. Again, taken ideally within 24 hours of sex, mm -hmm. but up to 72 hours. Patients should not exceed more than one dose daily. And what's the important messages um, to give to patients? Taking doxy with a big glass of water is important. Wearing sunscreen, um, the reason for the water is because we know that doxy sometimes can lead to what's called pill esophagitis, so when the esophagus the throat right gets irritated by the medication. So taking it with a big glass of water, not lying down for 30 minutes after you take it, these can help with that. Wearing sunscreen is important and then avoiding dairy products, calcium and acids or multivitamins two hours before or after taking doxy. Um, part of prescribing doxy is screening patients for other STIs every three months. And then folks often ask about lab monitoring. Most people think this is really unlikely um, unless there are underlying conditions, but some places are uh, recommending an annual check or primarily for liver function. All right, what about doxypep for cisgender women? And again, by cisgender, I mean someone who is assigned female at birth and identifies as female. So we know that doxypep is effective, right, in MSM and trans women. Yeah. Um, but yeah. of course, we see these STIs, and we've been talking about this today, and you're going to hear a lot about this next, um, that syphilis is, you know, has just skyrocketed in cisgender women, leading, you know, to this you know, devastating um, situation we're in with congenital syphilis. So what about doxypep um, for cisgender women? So an RCT looked at this question specifically in young women in Kenya, and the results were just published last month. Um, you, and you, but you probably heard about uh, the results last year because there were also a lot of press as they were presented as at various conferences prior to the publication, which just came out, like I said, in December. All right. So unfortunately. Um, doxypep was not effective in this study. It's called the DPEP study. And, you know, this was really devastating news for everyone because we were hoping to see similar results, right? Um, so as the results were analyzed, the authors, um, the researchers were able to do what's called a hair analysis to look for what we, you know, objective measures of drug levels um, in the body because hair actually, drug levels accumulate in the hair and you can figure out um, more or less how much medication someone was taking. So they were able to look at a random subset of study participants and they found actually that 44% did not have any detectable levels of doxycycline. So this is right very significant, obviously, um, and so the authors said, you know, the differing results between trials among MSM um, and trans women and this trial among cisgender women are likely explained by the low use of doc doxycycline. 
So we don't have, you know, we can't necessarily say we have proof of this, right? Um, but I think many people feel confident that this is likely the primary explanation for the difference. We also know in Kenya, there's really a high prevalence of tetracycline resistant gonorrhea. So this may add um, to the explanation as well. And there was a really low incidence of syphilis. So the trial was not powered to assess really the effect of doxypep on um, prevention of syphilis. So if the explanation for the difference is, you know, really that doxy wasn't used um, much in the study, and it's interesting because the self-reported adherence in the study was quite high compared to what they found in the hair samples. And that obviously requires um, more investigation. I mean, just to, you know, really figure this out and tease this apart. Um, some of, you know, the similar issues were seen in HIV trials um, for PrEP for HIV prevention in the early studies as well. So, but this means what? It means it may be effective in women, but we don't have the data to say that it is. So just keep that in mind. Okay, moving along. So there are some important unanswered questions about doxypep. And the two primary, well, it's sort of three, but um, two categories of questions. Just for some background, most of you know that over time, since the development of antibiotics, overuse and misuse of antibiotics has led, um, have led to a rise in what's called antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. So one major concern about doxypep is that it may increase the prevalence of antibiotic resistance in STI-related bacteria. The other concern about antimicrobial resistance, which is also called AMR, it's the acronym, is that it may occur in non-STI related bacteria. For example, Staph aureus, which is a bacteria that prim primarily um, lives in the skin. And we know doxycycline is often used to treat skin and soft tissue infections. So that obviously you can imagine might be problematic. The other main concern about doxypep is the potential effects um, of intermittent use of doxy on what's called the gut microbiome. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, we all have good or normal bacteria that live in our intestines, our gut, right? Um, and the concern is that doxypep may cause a change in this balance of microorganisms, what we also call flora. So it could change the diversity of flora um, it could lead to the development of drug resistance in the gut bacteria we have, because we have, like I said, all this bacteria in our gut, good and bad. Um, and that these changes could really disrupt the gut microbiome with these unknown impacts on the individual and the population levels. And this can also be true for the microbiomes of the mouth um, and the skin, but the main focus has been um, the potential effects on the gut. So get going on, moving on, the big question, you know, we have these questions about, you know, what could happen um, on a population level with doxypep, but mo moving on to implementation in real life, who should be offered doxypep, right? This is a big question that programs, clinics, um, local health jurisdictions who create guidelines, this is what you know, folks are really thinking about as they roll this out on the ground. So how should it be implemented in the real world? Well, we know that the study eligibility, right? So in this major US RCT, the doxypep trial, the, and I didn't have time to go over this, um, we didn't get into the details, but the study eligibility was that participants had to have a bacterial STI, so gonorrhea, chlamydia, or, or syphilis, um, in the past year, this was one of the one of the study el eligibility criteria. So now we have a number of local jurisdictions and some states that have put out guidelines for doxypep, and you'll see that it varies quite a bit. It's really interesting to look and see how different um, guidelines have been written, and some have advocated for broader use. So what would that mean? So we'd meet patient demand. You know, there are patients who haven't had a bacterial STI in the past year that may still want access to doxypep, right? So broader use would do that. Um, it could potentially create less stigma because we don't have to ask patient specific 
as many questions and details to make sure they qualify. Um, it may create more equity, right? But what are the negatives? Well, it may end up causing um, really below standard, what we call antimicrobial stewardship, right? Using antibiotics judiciously, trying not to overprescribe. So what about more restrictive use? Because that would be another option if our primary concern, right, are these unanswered questions around antimicrobial resistance or effects on the microbiome. We could decide, and some jurisdictions have decided to be more restrictive. Um, and so what, what does this do? Well, it maximizes the benefit risk ratio, right? It minimizes excess antibiotic use, but it's really a lot more complicated to identify candidates um, and to screen folks for you know, the eligibility criteria. So this would mean you know, making sure we know more details about potentially the sex someone has, the number of partners, their STD history, you know, really digging into um, very personal information that many patients may not want to disclose. And then we may miss people and we may end up um, dealing with issues around equity. And we saw this particularly with the rollout of the MPOX or formerly known as monkeypox vaccine um, when, when you know, folks had to meet very specific criteria with initial rollout to have access to the vaccine. And that created a lot of problems um, around equity, um, stigma and the like. So really though, as we think about all of this and and folks are making decisions um, about how to implement this on the ground. We just wanna make sure we have a proactive approach, right? Because we know that often the people that first access a new effective strategy like this, and we've seen this with HIV prep, we, those who first come seeking this are not necessarily those who may need it the most. So we risk worsening disparities. It's important also to think about generating um, evidence to guide how we roll it out, but we don't wanna wait for it because here we have this new incredibly effective strategy. Let's move it forward. We wanna of course tailor um, the strategy to local epidemiology and resources. And then importantly, as clinicians, we wanna use shared decision-making with patients. Okay, so I'm gonna move pretty quickly through this, but just so you have it and you know it's out there, and for reference, um, the preliminary CDC DOXYPEP guidelines were posted in October, so you can read about those. Um, they also you know, put out their draft on what an initial and follow-up DOXYPEP uh, visit should look like. And you can see one thing that's crossed out here, the initial draft included language about a doxycycline reducing the efficacy of hormonal contraception. This has been debunked. Um, it's a holdover from the past. And my understanding is it will be removed from the final guideline. So we don't need to worry about that. Okay, moving on to HIV. So I just wanna, we're gonna do a very uh, quick whirlwind tour of HIV um, prevention. So like I said, uh, we've got HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or HIV prep. We have HIV post-exposure prophylaxis or HIV PEP. And then we have um, treatment as prevention, also known as TASP or U equals U. So what do we have? What are our options right now for HIV prep? So there's three main strategies. Well, there are three um, strategies total. So we have the primary strategy still, which is daily oral prep. And you'll see here the medication I've listed, which is now generic, um, the approximate cost out of pocket, not including insurance adjustments um, per month. And you'll see there's a generic, Truvada, um, and then what's also called Discovy, which is still um, brand, so much more expensive. We have, again, a different oral strategy, which is known as 211 or on-demand prep. Um, and this is taking pills when you need them, um, right before sex and then twice after sex at a specific interval. And if you want more information, um, you can find it online. There's great mm -hmm. infographics about how about how um, how to take two one one prep. Um, prep, sorry. 
you definitely have to plan ahead because the first dose needs to be um, no sooner than two hours, uh, 24 to two hours before sex. And then you take, and that's a, a two pills, and then you take one pill um, every 24 hours for two doses after. Okay, and then the third strategy, which rolled out much more recently, is injectable prep. The medication is long-acting injectable cabotegravir, also known as Apertude. You can see that this is incredibly expensive. So whirlwind tour of HIV PEP. Um, it's important to remember there's so much out about PrEP right now, but we need to always remember PEP because PEP um, is often very difficult to access in many locations. And this is a problem many of us are continuing to work on. And um, I, anyone who has the power to advocate for increased access to HIV PEP, I encourage you to do so. Most important is knowing the risk of HIV acquisition from different sexual acts, right? And so this is a handy chart um, that CDC has online. And it includes um, the probability, again, this is uh, you know modeling of acquiring HIV per 10,000 exposures for different acts of sex. So I think this is important and definitely worth looking at. And um, we know there's factors that increase risk, including STIs, acute HIV infection, obviously when viral loads are very high, uh, late stage HIV infection, like I said, these high HIV viral loads, and then any trauma to tissue. Um, where sex occurs, what are factors that decrease the risk? So using condoms, uh, we know male circumcision can help, antiretroviral treatment, which is treatment as prevention, um, and then someone taking HIV PrEP. And we know that PrEP, when it's taken correctly, um, is in the very high 90s in terms of percent um, efficacy. All right, so here is just for your reference, some handy information about HIV PEP. And I think you see the first step here is to assess, um, again, someone's risk for acquisition, and then really using shared decision-making with patients to decide whether to move forward. A great important resource is the National Clinician's Post-Exposure Prophylaxis, uh, Prophylaxis or PEP hotline, and the number is listed there for you. Okay, and then our last HIV prevention strategy is HIV treatment as prevention. So TASP, again, um, U equals U, it's the other catchy phrase that's used. And what does this mean? So because we know now based on great studies that taking HIV medication um, that effectively lowers the HIV viral load to in the body to essentially undetectable levels we know that this eliminates the risk of HIV transmission to partners. So when um, this research, you know, came out, the, I mean, the results, it was really important. Many researchers uh, knew this, but we needed the data to really back it up. Um, and so now we know this is a very effective prevention method for anyone who has HIV, who's living with HIV. And I'm just gonna leave you um, with a reminder that whenever possible, we really wanna think about providing comprehensive sexual health services, which include all of these components. Do we always have time to think about these, um, look at these, advocate for these? No, we often don't, but I think it's important that we have them all you know, in our mind and we're trying whenever we can um, to really think about comprehensive sexual health services you know, primary prevention, vaccines, like I said, PEP, PrEP, and TASP, um, secondary prevention, meaning screening and treatment and partner services, but then also really thinking about and figuring out how to really address the social determinants of health because we know how important um, this is in our fight around this STI and HIV syndemic. And then what about policy and really creating policy and changing policy to address um, these issues? All right, so that is my whirlwind tour of STI and HIV prevention. Please keep it in mind when you are dealing with syphilis because you should always think about these other issues. Um, always important to keep it in mind.
And I am going to, we're going to have a break, I know, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce my colleague who um, I've worked with on and off for many years, um, Dr. Sharon Adler. Sharon is clinical faculty um, at the California Prevention Training Center and assistant clinical professor at UCSF in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Dr. Adler has worked in the STD field for 20 years, including 10 years of work at the California, California Department of Public Health STD Control Branch. She's board certified in preventive medicine, public health, and has clinical experience working in community health and public health clinics in the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as at the San Francisco STD Clinic, um, which is City Clinic. In her current position, Dr. Adler develops curricula and conducts and coordinates STD trainings for CDPTC. So after our break, Sharon is going to speak with you. Um, and then I will let Kelly close us out before the break. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tamara, and to Wyatt Hand and to Ina Park for the excellent presentations. We are a little bit off of our schedule, so we're going to go ahead and take our break now, but we will come back five minutes early. For those who want to come back five minutes early, we'll be back at 1015 your time to do a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll jump into our next session um, right at 1020 your time. Thanks so much. We'll be back in five. Okay, back soon, but it is 10.15 Arizona time. Tamara and Wyatt, are you all available for a quick Q&A and then we'll jump back into content? Wonderful. Great, so of course for the audience, if you all are still on break, that is totally fine, but I did wanna just open up space for folks who may have some questions. There is nothing currently in the Q&A, so we do have time. I'll ask some questions. In the meantime, but if folks want to type anything into the Q&A, remember we are available to answer questions that way as well. Um, I will start with one question for you, Dr. Hand, which is about treatment intervals for syphilis of late, late, or unknown duration. You mentioned in your presentation that the CDC, based on clinical experience, might allow up to 14 days between the three weekly injections on the longer side of things. And I just wanted to be really clear, were you talking about pregnant people or non-pregnant people? Definitely non-pregnant people, um, as, we will, as we will learn in the two uh, upcoming presentations, the uh, recommendation for pregnant people is much more strict. Um, and it, it kind of depends on where you are, but we really, really wanna keep that seven day interval for pregnant people uh, much less flexible for those who are pregnant. Exactly. Thanks so much. Just wanted to make sure that we had made that distinction because we will cover it again. And it is like a really important difference treating pregnant and non-pregnant um, folks. I had another question since you have the floor. Um, you showed a lot of great pictures about primary and secondary syphilis and different kinds of lesions. And I was just wondering if you could speak to infectiousness of these different lesions, like when you think of the most infectious stages of syphilis and which lesions are infectious to other people via mucosal contact, like what do you think of? Yeah, so um, when we talk about infectiousness, typically um, stages that are earlier in uh, the infection process are um, uh, more infectious. So uh, things like primary syphilis, that's shanker, extremely infectious. Um, and uh, you can think of that as there's a bacteria or the, the spirochete is actually in that, um, that site. And so if you have contact with that lesion, it can be passed to another person. Um, so uh, shanker is very uh, contagious. Um, uh, mucus patches, um, any of the uh, oral pharyngeal manifestations, um, and the um, uh, condylomalata also uh, very infectious. So think of primary and secondary syphilis, those symptomatic stages as being the most infectious stages of syphilis. Perfect, thank you. We often get questions about that, so just thought that was worth highlighting. Now I'll turn to you, Tamara, question for you. You obviously covered doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis, which has been studied for prevention of syphilis in addition to gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and you also talked a little bit about HIV pre and post-exposure prophylaxis. Just wanted to kind of pick your brain about 
the tie-ins between syphilis and HIV and why we chose to present some brief HIV prevention content in addition to our syphilis content. Yeah, I mean, we know right through looking at epidemiology um, and other research around these infections that they really often um, coexist, right? So we often find in our patients who are diagnosed with syphilis an increased risk of either being infected with HIV or HIV acquisition. So we always wanna think about HIV because of that. When we have a patient living with HIV, we wanna think about syphilis as well as gonorrhea and chlamydia. And this is not for everyone, right? Um, if you know many patients with HIV um, are in monogamous relationships, uh, they don't have other sexual partners or they use condoms. So we shouldn't create stigma around um, this, but we definitely wanna think about it. It needs to be in our mind. We need to be able to have sexual health conversations with our clients and this is a skill right it's a skill it takes um, practice and I think I'm always still learning about how to have these conversations with patients so we need to be able to figure out what a specific patient's um, risk factors are for these you know co-occurring co infections um, but we always need to have them together in our minds so I think again this is part of comprehensive sexual health services we see syphilis, we think about HIV, we think about gonorrhea, we think about chlamydia. We don't always see them together, but we often do. And so when we think about whole person care, right, around sexual health, we need to have them all in mind. Great, thank you. That was an excellent answer and very informative to think about those infections as co-occurring and often traveling together. Okay, we are 20 past the hour. I just want to remind folks again that the Q&A is available. You're going to get an answer if you put something in there via me or we'll answer them out loud at the end of the next two sessions. So go ahead and use that Q&A. We are now going to take that deep dive that we promised into syphilis in pregnancy and congenital syphilis. Obviously, this is a really serious component of the talk because this is where we really have the opportunity to prevent things like stillbirths and syphilis deaths among babies. So we already heard the introduction about the fabulous Dr. Sharon Adler, and I will turn it over to her. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson Kelly, and I'm really happy to be with you all here virtually. I'm in California, you are in Arizona or other parts of the country to talk about syphilis, specifically syphilis management in pregnancy. Um, and let's hope I can advance my slides. Here we go. Um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, as an overview to my presentation, I'm going to be using a case-based presentation. So I've got a variety. I think I've got five case scenarios, hopefully to try and make this somewhat interactive for you all. I know it's hard to sit through many hours of syphilis. This is kind of dense, challenging information, but I really thank you all for being here. And just to mirror what Dr. Johnson said, we really welcome questions. There'll be another 10 minute time period after my presentation and Dr. Plotzker's presentation for Q&A. We welcome these questions. So as an overview to my content, I'm gonna show you some nice photos of clinical manifestations of syphilis in women. Uh, Dr. Hamp, who preceded me, showed many uh, photos of clinical um, of syphilis. Uh, those were primarily in uh, men. We'll talk about treatment in pregnancy, how it is stage-based treatment, but there are some differences when you could think about the non-pregnant population. We'll talk about serologic follow-up, how we really don't have enough time in most women who are treated for syphilis to see that uh, fourfold decline in six to 12 months or 12 months, really, because pregnancy is a nine-month duration and many women are not being screened very, very early on. Um, and then we'll talk about how screening in pregnancy really is the strategy that you can use. Uh, to prevent the development of congenital syphilis in those babies. And I'm not going to be focusing that much on congenital syphilis because I've got Dr. Plotzker following me to talk a lot of detail around um, congenital syphilis. But I'll talk about screening and how screening really is prevention. So here we have um, some photos of primary syphilis, all examples in females or in women. I want to stress that these often are painless lesions. If they get secondarily infected or if there's co-infection, they might have pain. But these may go unrecognized, um, particularly these are all kind of vulvar or perianal lesions, but if these lesions are higher up, if it's on the cervix or somewhere else in the in the vaginal vault, um, a female is not going to know that she has this lesion. I want to highlight um, one here in the middle that is a sing solitary uh, lesion with induration, minimal ex exudate in this lesion here on the left that show kind of the classic textbook um, 
uh, solitary lesions, but just to emphasize that same as in men, um, these lesions can be atypical. Here you have an example of three um, ulcers, and then here you have an example in the perianal area um, of multiple ulcers, and these can mimic herpes. And so we have to think about herpes. We also have to think about uh, syphilis in all of our patients who are presenting with ulcers. Uh, secondary syphilis, Dr. Hamp went through great detail about the clinical manifestations of secondary. I just want to share with you a few of these in women. So a diffuse macular papular rash is kind of the most classic morphologic feature, but the, the rash can really be of any morphology. So it can mimic many other conditions. And he went um, through great detail about some of the primary mimickers uh, and really keeping um, syphilis in your differential when someone who's sexually active Someone who's pregnant is sexually active, presents with a diffuse body rash. The teaching I always had is new onset um, a rash in a sexually active person, screen for syphilis. Your tests are really good in secondary syphilis. And then two other additional examples of the um, mucus patches. Uh, this is kind of a very, very um, you know, minimal um, uh, presentation on the buccal mucosa, but these can be very infectious. Other examples of, of cl clinical manifestations in women, uh, Dr. Hant showed you many pictures of condyloma lata in men. These are in females. Uh, so these definitely mimic warts or condyloma cuminata, but these are not warts. Uh, they also will go away on their own. <laughs> uh, the natural history, history, as Dr. Hamp showed, um, people may have their secondary manifestations for a few weeks, six to seven weeks, eight weeks, but then they will resolve on their own. Um, these also are extremely infectious lesions, and this is how syphilis is easily transmitted to partners. So other teaching that I've always been taught, new onset, what you think are genital warts, uh, always get your test for syphilis and anyone you're diagnosing new onset warts because it might actually not be warts, it might be condyloma lata. All right, um, I said I was gonna do a lot of audience polls and so here's our case study, our first one. Don't bring the poll up quite yet, but here we have our case patient, Stephanie. Um, she is a young female, 28 years of age. She has this sore on her vulva. She says it's painless, she just noticed it. Um, and she has had gonorrhea and chlamydia in the past. She has no history of, history of syphilis, no history of herpes. She dove, does has risk for um, STIs and syphilis. She's had three male partners in the past six months. Um, she has not left um, the country, so no travel. And you are working in a clinical environment. We were able to get a stat result. Uh, so you're thinking about syphilis um, and you get a stat RPR and that stat RPR is actually negative. So I want you now, you can pull up the poll now. I want you to think about how would you manage this patient? So this is a patient um, she has a painless indurated ulcer. Your STAT RPR is negative. Do you want to wait for further tests? Maybe you're going to do a quantitative RPR to determine treatment. Would you presumptively treat her for syphilis based on this clinical presentation and her sexual history? Would you order a specific treponemal test, a TPPA, um, or choice B and C? And so unfortunately in the, in the poll, you're not seeing B and C. B and C would be presumptively treat and order um, Treponemal test, A and C would be to wait for your test results and then um, and order a TPPA. So I'll give you an, a moment. And let's see what people are saying. All right, choice B and C. I'll show you, most of you, 74% um, got B and C, which was to presumptively treat and order a TPPA. That is how I would manage this patient. So. Um, what this is getting at is the limitations of some of your diagnostic tests in early syphilis. Um, and so this person is presenting with a, a textbook lesion of syphilis. Uh, so textbook lesion in that it is a classic solitary indurated ulcer with minimal exudate and she has risk for syphilis. Um, and so what I'm getting at here is that some of the limitations of our diagnostic tests in that Early on, when someone presents with a genital lesion that is ulcerative that might be primary syphilis or even is primary syphilis, your serology may be negative about a quarter of the time. Uh, so um, you want to presumptively treat for syphilis um, based on her epidemiologic risk, based on the clinical manifestations, and based on knowing that your diagnostic tests, unfortunately, are not 100%. If you were working in an STD clinic and you had a dark field, you could take a look and see that there were treponemes, but if you're, most places do not have access to dark field. So the strategy that we're using in this patient is highlighted in red here. 
Um, she was a patient who had suspicion that was high, and that's based on the classic textbook presentation of syphilis, and that she had general risk for STIs, having numerous partners in the past six months, having had STIs in the past, she has epidemiologic risk that's high for, for syphilis. So you would um, empirically treat her, even though that RPR is negative, we know it be, can be negative in early syphilis. And then the management would be to get another serology one week after treatment, um, and also to get a treponemal test. And on that repeat serology one week later, it may still be negative, but many times it actually is positive um, because that early treatment may not abort the antibody reaction that's going on in, in that person's body while they're developing antibodies. So that's great that 78% um, of you got that. So let's move on. Um, and I'm gonna share some of the challenges that we have with diagnostics. So Dr. Hant, who preceded me, talked in great detail about um, syphilis diagnostics and the various algorithms. I want to highlight specifically as it relates to pregnancy, some of the reasons why you might have false negatives um, when someone presents um, with, with, with clinical manifestations of syphilis. And so this case is, is, is um, an example of someone who presents with early primary. Um, and so you all need to be aware that your serology may be negative up to 25% of the time. The other um, scenario I want to present is a false negative that can occur um, and it's called the prozone reaction. I want to highlight this is an ex rare occurrence. It's usually less than 1%. However, it is somewhat more common in pregnancy. It's also more common in persons who have neurosyphilis. Um, and it's much more common in early syphilis, specifically secondary syphilis. Um, and so what happens is uh, you're seeing a patient. They've got a classic rash that you think is secondary syphilis. You have the lab draw results, the RPR is negative. Um, this can be due to the prozone. You need to ask the laboratorian to dilute that serum. Um, and on dilution, you're gonna get a positive result. And this is basically because um, this person has so much antibody around, it, they are, their high antibody is preventing the antibody antigen lattice formation, which is what that RPR test uses to read out a positive result. The other reason in syphilis that you might have false negatives, and this is actually false negatives with a treponemal test as well as with a non-treponemal test, is that over time, many, many, many years, uh, titers will drop. And Dr. Hanft showed you that serology, um, kind of the classic uh, 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 period, classic present, uh, serology results, how over time for both tests, even without treatment, um, titers may decline and may become negative. The other thing I wanna mention are biologic false positives. And so Dr. Hampt talked about the two screening algorithms. This really relates to the traditional screening algorithm where you're starting with a non-TREP test and then you're getting a treponemal test to confirm your result. Um, and so here is a scenario where you have a non-TREP test that is positive, but then your treponemal test is negative. And this is not that uncommon. It's about 1.5% of the general population has this biologic false positive. And it can occur due to concurrent viral illnesses, including HIV. Uh, biologic false positives are more common in older persons, can be more common in persons who have other chronic diseases, including hepatitis, other autoimmune diseases. The data around pregnancy, at this point, I think people are saying that they're conflicting. I looked at a very recent um, lab guideline looking at syphilis tests that came out in 2020, and there are three studies looking at pregnancy. At this point, some of them are showing there's higher rates of biologic false positives, others not. But keep it in mind, in the general population, you can have biologic false positives, so they can definitely occur in pregnancy. Take-home message here you need both treponemal and non-treponemal tests to make a diagnosis of syphilis, to confirm a diagnosis of syphilis. So both test types, very, very important. And that's just kind of a review of what was already discussed. All right, we're gonna jump into another case, again, to try and keep this interactive. So here we have a young female person, she's 30 years of age. Uh, she's being screened and she's being screened in the first trimester, so that's great. She is having early screening for syphilis. And here are her lab results. Her lab results, and here we're using not the traditional algorithm, we're using the reverse sequence screening algorithm, which was already uh, described to you. And her results are that she has the treponemal IgM, IgG antibody that's positive, but she has an RPR that's non-reactive. And then the laboratory automatically should go to a second treponemal test. Here they're using the most sensitive and specific test, which is the TPPA. Uh, so she has two tests that are positive that are treponemal tests, but the RPR is non-reactive. A little bit 
more history on this particular patient is that she did have a prior pregnancy, um, and that was five years ago. At that time, no other no treponemal tests were done because at that time your institution was using traditional algorithm. And at that time, her RPR was non-reactive. So our syphilis history or prior treatment of syphilis is not really very helpful here, but we know that she's never been treated for syphilis before. And she has this prior screen of RPR that was reactive, was, I'm sorry, excuse me, non-reactive five years ago. All right, so I think I have an audience poll coming up. So this is the scenario which we call discordant serologic test results. Um, and so you're gonna get a poll to see how you would manage this patient. She's pregnant, she's in her first trimester. What would your management be? Let's see if we can get that poll to come up. And if it can't come up, I'm going to have you all just kind of think of this in your head. We'll wait another moment. Is there a uh, poll coming? Give me 10 seconds to edit it. One second. Okay. Thank you. So the poll is going to ask you for the management of this pregnant patient first trimester. She has discordant serologic test results. Choice A, just repeat the serologies in three months. Choice B, her RPR is non-reactive. We don't need to treat her. Choice C, she has never been treated for syphilis before. She needs treatment. Or choice D, none of the above. Think in your head how you might respond to that. And we'll see if we get the poll. Great. All right, again, how would you manage this pregnant patient First trimester, screen for pregnancy, has two treponemal tests that are positive and RPR that's non-reactive. What of the following um, uh, responses seems like the most appropriate management for this patient? And I'll give you a few seconds to respond. All right, let's share those results, thank you. All right, so we have about 32% who would just follow her, get another serology in three months, and 60% are basically saying no prior syphilis treatment. She needs treatment. I see that typo there. <laughs> it's a different way of spelling syphilis. That's fine. <laughs> Let's close the slide. And so what the CDC would guide and how I would manage this patient is she has never been treated for syphilis before. She needs treatment because we have two treponemal tests that are positive. Um, and so that is the best and the most appropriate management for her. And so what we're getting at is the reverse screening algorithm. She is an example of someone who is EIA positive, screened with this, with this newer, somewhat newer, it's been now around for at least 10, 15 years, EIA positive, RPR negative, and has a second treponemal test that's positive. And so what the CDC guideline says on these patients is, you have two treponemal tests that are positive. In the scenario where someone has never been treated for syphilis before, and that is this patient, um, she has, has had syphilis at some point in her lifetime and it's been untreated. Um, and particularly because she's pregnant and we know that in pregnancy, a mom can transmit to the baby at any stage of syphilis, even at late, late and untreated syphilis or late and unknown, unknown duration, uh, we need to treat her. And that would be what the guidelines recommend. So I hope that's a you know important teaching point for you all, that 30% that didn't get this correctly. Um, the CDC says you evaluate clinically, make sure there's no signs of current syphilis, but if the person has not been previously treated, you're gonna treat with three doses of benzathine penicillin. I wanna also just mention how would you manage her if she was somebody who was EIA positive, RPR negative, but then that second treponemal test was negative. So the strategy here is um, we're thinking it might just be an isolated false positive EIA, which is not that uncommon in non-pregnant and actually in pregnant persons. Uh, but with the CDC guides, if you have just one test, one treponemal test that's positive, but then the two other following tests, the RPR, and the second treponemal test, which is a very sensitive and specific test, that syphilis is really unlikely. In pregnancy, the guidelines are repeat again in around four weeks, your titers, all three of them. If that ser serologic pattern remains the same, or sometimes the EIA is gonna become negative now, um, we don't need to treat. So that's the scenario where you don't treat, you do repeat all of those titers in four weeks. Um, so, that is a little bit more information about the reverse sequence screening algorithm. And I know um, interpretation of serologic results for syphilis is very complicated and confusing and challenging. And these are two wonderful resources. They're up on the California PTC web, 
website. And I believe you guys are going to get all these links. You're going to get all these slides. But they go through in great detail the traditional algorithm that is what's here on the right, the 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 um, reverse sequence algorithm, and the various possible interpretations, as well as recommended management actions. Um, and I also want to give a plug here for the SCDCCN. We get lots of questions about serologic management. We are always there for you to address quick cases like this, where it's it's you're uncertain how to interpret your serologic results. All right, we're gonna move on now um, to treatment. And we'll talk about how treatment is different in pregnancy, um, but it is still stage-based treatment. And I've got a few cases here. So we're gonna start with this first case. And I believe this was a case that um, maybe presented at one of the uh, Arizona sites. Um, a woman who's 37 years of age, she presents to the, women, the women's clinic and she's about five months along. So this is not early in pregnancy. She's more than halfway there. Um, she has not had any prenatal testing yet, um, but she's coming in basically saying, you know, I had lab work seven months ago, um, but she's also coming in saying that her current boyfriend told her to get checked for syphilis. So you're concerned about syphilis in this patient. You're able to do a good head to toe exam. And I want to stress anyone um, who you're evaluating for syphilis, and if they're a female and they have a cervix and a vaginal vault, you want to put a speculum in and take a look inside because you could have a hidden uh, manifestation of primary or secondary syphilis. Um, but you do a good head-to-toe exam, um, you do an exam of the skin, and you do a good neurologic exam. She's got no findings of active syphilis. You're able to confirm that she did have a partner, her boyfriend, who was treated for early syphilis two months ago. So she would be considered a contact to that part, that boyfriend. Um, and you do test her for syphilis, you screen her. And here are tighter results. She has an RPR that's one to 64 and a TPPA that's positive. So she's got two tests that are positive for syphilis. Um, and she actually has a negative RPR from three years ago in her prior pregnancy. But we know that she has syphilis now. So what we're getting at in this next case is how would you treat this pregnant patient who we know has syphilis? And in the back of your head, think about how am I staging her? Because staging influences treatment. Uh, and so you can pull up the poll and we'll talk about what is treatment is recommended for this pregnant patient. What stage does he have? That will determine what treatment. Um, is it one dose of benzathine penicillin G 2.4 milliunits? Is it one dose with the addition of a second dose in seven days? Might you try ceftriaxone uh, for 10 days? Or the last choice, choice D, benzathine penicillin G, uh, 7.2 milliunits IM given in three weekly injections of 2.4. Uh, let's hear what you say. And I just want to share with you, there might be more than one right answer <laughs> or more than one strategy. Let's see what everyone said. Okay, so this is very interesting. Uh, so half of you are saying that she might be staged as late latent and she needs three doses. And then the other half is I saying either a single dose or two doses. And I will share with you um, what I believe is the correct response. And that gets to what is her stage? Her stage is early latent syphilis. And we'll talk about staging. We'll review that, which is already discussed. And because her stage is early latent syphilis, and this is great. I'm glad that there's differences in responses because this is a real teaching point. Um, what the CDC says is when you stage early latent syphilis, Adequate treatment for this patient is either one dose of benzathine penicillin, that is stage-based treatment for early latent syphilis, and there is a some experts recommendation, um, and I've got a bit of information about that some expert recommendation, that some obstetricians and some folks in the STD world would feel more comfortable with giving a dose in day one and then a dose seven days later, so two doses, and so situation that you're giving one for the mom and one for the baby. Um, but she is staged with early latent syphilis, so we do not need to give her three doses. So choice D is really not the appropriate management for this patient. Um, I know that everyone wants to make sure that everybody is well treated, but early latent syphilis can be treated with a single dose, um, and, and some experts give that second dose. And so let's go on to staging. I just got some information that my internet connection is unstable, <laughs> so I might actually, I'm going to get rid of my um, video. That might, so that you're not seeing me, but that might save, because um, I just got a little alert. Um, but so let's go on to latent, latent syphilis staging. So to, because this patient is an example of someone who actually meets criteria for early latent disease. So someone who has screening tests that are positive for syphilis, and she had two tests that are positive for syphilis, um, 
She has no physical signs or symptoms of syphilis. You do a good head to toe exam. She meets criteria for latent infection. And then latent infection is further divided into early latent if the person meets any one of these criteria. In this particular case, she was a known contact to an early case. And so she had a boyfriend who she's been having ongoing sex with who was treated for primary syphilis um, within the past two months. She meets criteria for early latent disease. So early latent disease, yes, we it's stage-based treatment. If she hadn't met any of these criteria, she would have been staged for late latent or latent of unknown duration, but she met criteria for early latent. And that is why, how do we treat primary, secondary and early latent disease? In general, it is treated with one dose of benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million units. Um, we wanna use the LA as Dr. Hamp discussed. We don't have any alternatives in a, non -pre in a pregnant person. Uh, and so penicillin is the only treatment that we can use for syphilis in pregnancy. We treat with the penicillin regimen appropriate for stage of infection. There is one caveat to that, and here is what the CDC says, certain evidence that additional benzathine penicillin is beneficial. So this is a some experts recommendation and that many obstetricians and many STI experts will give a second dose of benzathine penicillin seven days after that first dose. And that is why in this case that we just went through, there were two possible correct answers and it was the first two, A and B. The other thing that I want to mention is that we cannot use any alternatives. Um, anyone who has a clear history of penicillin allergy, and here I want to say lots of people say they have penicillin allergy, uh, but we really need to make sure they truly have a penicillin allergy. This, if, if, you're, if they have a penicillin allergy, you want to discuss with them kind of the details about that. You might want to send them to get skin testing, um, but if they tr have true um, Ig mediated um, allergy, they should be desensitized. There's a whole um, desensitization strategy and algorithm that is in the CDC treatment guidelines. Um, and then these women get treated with benzathine penicillin. Um, Tamara discussed how we have lots of co-infections. So any patients with syphilis should also be tested for HIV. Um, that is part of the treatment and management of anyone in pregnancy. A little bit more information about this some experts guidance on the second dose for early syphilis. I wanna say this is really based on clinical and anecdotal um, experience of um, STDI experts and of OBGYNs. Um, there are no randomized control trials, but there are not a lot of randomized control trials in many of the syphilis guidelines. Uh, we do know that there can be pharmacokinetic data um, that shows that um, penicillin may not be so well absorbed in pregnant people and we're treating the mom as well as the baby. And so we wanna make sure that that baby is getting adequate treatment and that's why as I said earlier, and this is from Dr. Jean Sheffield, who's an obstetrician. Uh, she's kind of one of my gurus in, in this field. And she basically says one for the mom and one for the baby. And that's why, um, and many other experts do. And if we look internationally, you know, how common is this two doses for early latent syphilis or early syphilis in pregnant persons? In England, the BASH guidelines recommend this only in those who are farther along in pregnancy where that baby may be kind of a larger, larger gestation. So only um, at 28 weeks to term. Australia, they just use stage-based treatment. And then European guidelines, Canadian guidelines, those are similar to the CDC. One dose stage-based, but some experts give that second dose. So just a little bit more information on that second dose. So in this case scenario, either choice one or choice B would be, at, would be appropriate treatment for a pregnant person presenting in early latent syphilis. We're gonna launch, I, I said I was gonna try and keep this interactive and we're gonna launch into another case study. Um, uh, this is a 20-year-old woman, um, pregnant female, we're screening early. She got screened in her um, at 10 weeks gestation, so at her first prenatal visit. Uh, and here, um, she has um, treponemal IgM, IgG that's positive, and RPR that's one to four. She's never been screened for syphilis before. Her exam as well shows no signs of primary or secondary syphilis. Um, and because she's never been screened for syphilis before, we only have this positive result now, no history of syphilis in the past. She gets staged as late, late, or late of unknown. Um, so what we're gonna get in here is, what is her treatment? Is this adequate treatment and how the doses were given to her? So we know that treatment for late latent syphilis or latent of unknown duration is three doses of benzathine penicillin. Um, and this was already mentioned by Dr. Hamp, how ideally these are given at seven days in pregnancy. Um, this particular patient got her second dose actually at day 10. 
And then she gets her third dose at day seven. You're seeing her one month later. So no one really picked up on that. She had her second dose at day 10. Hmm, that wasn't seven days. You're seeing her one month later. And at your one month follow-up visit on her, what might you do? Uh, she was supposed to be treated at seven day interval. She had her, her three doses, but her second dosing interval was 10 days. How would you manage her? And this is another audience poll. All right, so would you just give her a single dose of benzene penicillin? Would we say no additional treatment needed, just follow her RPR? Or do we need to completely restart that benzene penicillin G series and give her three more doses, um, weekly injections? I'll give you a moment or two to think. Couple more seconds. All right, let's see what people said. Great, okay. So I'm seeing that more than half of you, 55% would restart the benzene penicillin, give her three weekly injections. 15% um, said just give one single dose and 28% no additional treatment needed, just follow RPR. So again, this is great teaching. Um, and so I wanna really um, stress this point in any pregnant person, um, if their dosing interval is more than nine days, and this is new in 2020, um, you are gonna need to restart completely that three weekly injections. And so let's look now in more detail I'm actually going to skip this for a moment. You know, let's look in more detail at what the CDC said on treatment for late latent and latent of unknown duration. And this is specifically for uh, pregnant persons. So we know that the optimal interval is seven days between doses. We also know it's challenging for people to get into to see us and people are not necessarily going to come in at that seven days. And so the rationale behind that seven days is we have some data that shows that 40% of women during pregnancy if you were to detect by the pharmacokinetic data that their levels of the of, of um, benzene penicillin are below treponemicidal levels, meaning that they're below the level that's gonna kill that, um, the bacteria treponema pallidum after nine days. And so we have that information. And that's why previously the guidelines were seven days. After seven days, if the person missed that seven day, the CDC said before, you gotta retreat. They have somewhat made this a little bit um, looser based on this information that um, we know that seven days is ideal, but maybe up to nine days would be okay. Um, so if you have a patient, they're supposed to come back at seven days, you notice they didn't show. Kind of all hands on deck, using our disease investigators and other folks, or everyone to try and get this patient in. So lots of efforts to try and get that patient back in so she doesn't miss the dose within two days. If it's a missed dose more than nine days, those are not acceptable. You would need to restart the entire series of three weekly doses. So that's why this case demonstrates this patient had a missed dose that was 10 days. That's more than nine days. She needs to restart the entire series of three weekly doses because you need, um, you need levels of treponemocidal killing um, antibiotic for a total of about 21 days. That's why there's seven days. And if you have two days in between or three days in between where there's not bacterial levels, I mean, I mean trepanemocidal levels of benzene penicillin, um, that we're not going to get treatment in. And we really want to treat the mom and the baby. Uh, so just to emphasize this point, this is another important teaching because um, about half of you had a different response to that question. So this is specifically for late latent. I'm going to go back one slide um, and just share with you how this is stage-based treatment. So in pregnancy, it's a similar stage-based treatment. Staging is late latent or late of unknown. Non-pregnant persons and pregnant persons get that same treatment, three doses, each at one week intervals. It's just that in pregnancy, we have a stricter, um, we need to stay stricter to that seven-day interval and maybe out to nine days. But at 10 days, you got to restart the entire series. So hopefully that is really Crystal clear to everyone. I'm really glad that we're doing these audience polls. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on now and talk about a couple treatment um, issues. One to start with is the gerich hirschheimer reaction, which is something that it can occur in non-pregnant pregnant persons as well as in pregnant persons. Um, and so 
This is where, and you have to tell people about this, after they're getting treated with their benzidine penicillin, they may get home within a few hours and feel worse. <laughs> and this is not an allergic reaction to benzidine penicillin. Um, it's more common in early syphilis, more common in primary and secondary, not so common in latent syphilis. They may get home and have a fever within a few hours. Um, they may get home and have an exacerbation of their rash, uh, have headache and myalgias. Um, and this is basically because we know this isn't a sign that the benzathine penicillin is working uh, so that um, the bacteria, the trepanema pallidum, um, toxins are being released as the bacteria are being killed. And that's why we're having the Steratogema reaction. Specifically in pregnancy, uh, there is some data to show that women who are treated during the second half of pregnancy, so beyond 20 weeks, may be at risk for premature labor and or fetal distress as part of the Steratogema reaction. Um, so patients need to be ma made aware that if they go home and they start to go into labor, they need to, you know, have transport and contact you and come into the to the, the clinic or the hospital setting or the IHS site. But concern for this complication should not delay treatment because the only way to treat syphilis and congenital syphilis and prevent congenital syphilis is by treating those patients um, with benzathine penicillin. Um, the, in addition, as it relates to treatment and management in pregnancy, during the second half of pregnancy, moms um, who are 20 weeks or greater uh, who have a diagnosis of syphilis, you need to do an obstetric ultrasound. And that's because you may find, find things on that obstetric ultrasound that are consistent already uh, with changes of consistent with congenital syphilis. And so if you see hepatomegaly, ascites, high drops in that baby, fetal anemia or thickened placenta, these are the babies that are unfortunately at greater risk for treatment failure. They really need treatment, but you need to manage um, in consultation with an OB specialist or a, a, a provider who's doing obstetric care. Um, and here um, you may need observed treatment on LND. And here, this is kind of a pearl from Dr. Sheffield again. Um, I We've had questions about this. And so we've consulted with her, how should these babies be managed? Um, and if on ultrasound, you are seeing any abnormalities that are consistent with congenital syphilis, her guidance is if they're post 24 weeks, which would be post viability, they may be more likely to have a Gerasherschimer reaction because they have a high organism load because you actually have uh, congenital syphilis in that baby and you have syphilis in that mom, um, that her strategy is that she brings these moms who have these abnormalities on ultrasound into L&D to give observed treatment. However, um, if you have a, a mom who is 28 weeks, has a completely normal looking ultrasound, so there's no findings of congenital syphilis on that ultrasound, those moms just get treated at home and given um, information. If they go into labor, they should come, come to the hospital. I all right, I think this is my final audience. No, actually, I think I've made one more audience poll. Um, I want to just go back to our treated case. I think this was our second treated case where we staged as early latent syphilis, um, and we decided to treat with two doses of benzathine penicillin, one for the mom, one for the baby. And we're going to talk now about serologic follow-up in um, pregnancy specifically, because it is different than serologic follow-up um, in non-pregnant persons, because pregnancy is nine months. And if you remember, remember what Dr. Hanth said about serologic follow-up, it may take out to 12 months for serologies to decline in early syphilis and out to 24 months for serology to decline in late latent syphilis. So we don't have that time in pregnancy. So here our pregnant woman um, had an RPR that was one to 64 at treatment and her treatment was at 20 weeks gestation. She had a follow-up serology eight weeks later and her serology has dropped twofold uh, to one to 32. The question to you all is how would you manage her now? And that's what this poll is. So she was treated at 20 weeks, had an initial titer of one to 64. Eight weeks later, her titer has only dropped twofold. Um, and she was appropriately treated as an early latent case with two doses of benzathine penicillin. So you can bring that poll up. Would you give her an additional single dose of benzathine penicillin? Choice B, no additional treatment is needed. We would just get another RPR at delivery. Choice C, retreat with three weekly injections. And the final choice, no additional treatment is needed. Just get another RPR in one month. So what this case is getting at is what is the follow-up in um, syphilis in pregnancy and how soon might we see tighter changes? 
I'm going to give you another couple seconds to see what your responses are. All right, let's see what everyone's responses are. Can you share the poll? Thank you. All right, so a complete spread. <laughs> In, very interesting. So 21% would give one dose, 28% would retreat. So those are the two I wanna really um, emphasize. Um, this is not yet treatment failure. She does not need any an additional BIC. It's really just been not enough time um, and no additional treatment is needed. And actually what the CDC says is actually the second choice was only 12% of you got. And so this is a great teaching point. Uh, the teaching point here is that um, we, we don't need to worry about treatment failure at this point. She has been treated adequately with her two doses of benzathine penicillin, which is stage-based treatment for early latent syphilis. And it may take time for those titers to drop fourfold. Her titer has not risen at all. Um, and so we're not at all concerned for treatment failure. We just know that we need time. And, it, it, and within eight weeks, we're not going to expect a fourfold decline. That would be pretty rare. Um, and what the CDC guidelines are no, is no additional treatment needed at this time, repeat RPR at delivery. And let's go on to the next slide and talk about how we monitor titers in pregnancy and how, how we may not have enough time to see those titers decline fourfold. Um, and this is a change in the 2021 treatment guidelines. Basically, the guidelines say is for a woman who was treated and she was less than 24 weeks gestation, the follow-up titer should be done at eight weeks. That is our case scenario. And then again at delivery. So it's really just two other times, as long as there's no sign of treatment failure based on that repeat serology. So if this patient had a, a titer it was that was one to 256 now, then we're getting concerned and then we definitely would wanna retreat. Um, but her titer had dropped twofold. Um, so we just need to repeat her titer again at delivery. If it's a woman who was treated, maybe she's 28 weeks gestation is when you get your first dose in, you just repeat that titer at delivery. The only time that you would repeat a titer sooner is if there are concerns for reinfection or signs and symptoms of primary secondary syphilis, or if that initial repeat titer shows signs of treatment failure. Um, and treatment failure or reinfection is when you have a fourfold rise that's sustained over the course of two weeks. So the take home message here, and this is another great teaching point, is that the majority of women are gonna deliver those babies prior to having a fourfold decline. It's just that we don't have 12 months in pregnancy. We have a nine month pregnancy, person gets screened and you already have heard that a lot of screening takes place later in pregnancy. If you start treatment at 30 weeks and then retest in eight weeks, that has not been enough time for those titers to decline fourfold. And here is some data around that. This is a study that came out in 2014 by Rack et al. Um, looking at uh, maternal titers um, after adequate uh, syphilis treatment. Um, they studied 166 women. They were anywhere between uh, 24 weeks and um, 30 29 weeks plus or minus five weeks. So um, up to 34 weeks. All stages had a decline. In this graphic, we see secondary and primary had a greater decline in titer, latent syphilis, early latent, late latent and unknown, slower titer decline. Take home message for this study was that only 38% had a fourfold decline by delivery. Some of the factors associated with the lack of the fourfold decline were latent syphilis, older age, and less time from treatment to delivery. What's not up on this slide is that they also looked at congenital syphilis outcomes in these babies. It was a retrospective study, and they found that there was no association with having a congenital syphilis outcome with the lack of fourfold decline. It was similar in those who had the fourfold decline, as well as those who had lacked the fourfold decline. And so their take-home conclusion from the study was that the failure to achieve a fourfold decline by delivery is more a reflection of treatment timing than of treatment failure. And so those moms do not need doses and doses of benzathine penicillin. They have been adequately treated as long as they had their, their doses in early latent syphilis or late latent syphilis. Um, this just shows you in non-pregnant persons how long it may take for titers to um, drop. So it may take out to 12 months in early syphilis primary and secondary, and in early latent and late latent, it can take out to 24 months. And so again, in pregnancy, 
we don't have that time. Um, and that's why we're, we don't, we only want to check titers a few times after treatment. And then we only really get concerned if titers are rising. Um, if they're slowly declining, that is a sign of adequate treatment. Um, and then I want to conclude, I think I have a few minutes left to talk about prevention of congenital syphilis and how screening really is prevention. Um, I'm going to go through this slide very quickly because this is CDC guidelines on screening and actually within IHS. I think you have your own specific guidelines, which is three times screening in pregnancy. But nationally, uh, because each state has different data around screening, um, national guidance is to screen at the first prenatal visit, ideally in the first trimester, and then rescreen based on risk. Some of the risks that we are aware of for syphilis acquisition are um, you saw this on the epidemiologic data that Dr. Park shared at the beginning, drug misuse, concurrent STIs, and then some sexual behaviors around multiple partners, new partners, and partners with STIs. Um, the other way and the other great strategy, and, and I think both myself and Dr. Plotzker, who's following me, will be sharing timely treatment of syphilis during pregnancy. So treatment before four weeks of delivery is very effective. It's about 98% effective for prevention of congenital syphilis. So here, this comes from some guidelines that came out through IHS. I found this on, on the IHS website. And when we get to the q and I'd be really con, con, interested to see, see if people are aware of this. But in July of 2023, IHS came out with guidelines basically saying three-point screening for syphilis for all pregnant persons. Screen at the first trimester, beginning of the third trimester, and again at delivery. So this is not risk-based screening. This is three times in pregnancy you want to screen all pregnant persons. In addition, in this letter, there was um, a guideline to screen annually for all persons in Indian country within IHS for all ages, 13 to 64. So this is another strategy to get, to get at the kind of that disparity of native populations having higher rates of syphilis. Um, briefly about evaluation and management at delivery, um, we know that many people are, may not come for prenatal care. So if you have a mom who's delivered a baby, um, that mom and that baby should not leave the hospital if there has not been um, a serology, syphilis serology done, documented at least once during pregnancy. Moms who present without prenatal care, the same thing. She's at risk for congenital syphilis. You need to get a syphilis serology in that mom before she is discharged or before that baby is discharged. And then Dr. Plotzker, who is following me, is gonna give a lot more detail around this. And then I just wanna share this one slide on how effective um, congenital syphilis prevention is with treatment. It's about 98% effective overall. Table three on the left here looks at su success, that was my timer, excuse me, <laughs> success of treatment um, by stage. And the one caveat to this is that in secondary syphilis, when moms may have the highest burden of disease, slightly lower risk of treat, slightly higher risk of treatment failure. So um, treatment is very, very effective, um, slightly lower in secondary. And again, the closer that you get to term after 36 weeks, effectiveness decreases. Uh, so we want to get patients screened early in syphilis and we want if they're pregnant and we want to get those babies and moms treated um, because after you get after 36 weeks closer to delivery, and it's not been four weeks time, um, then there's a higher risk of treatment failure. But the take home message is that prevention of congenital syphilis is really screening those moms and treating those moms early. It's 98% effective. My take home points, syphilis can mimic any other diseases, keep it in your differential, do a good head to toe exam, do a speculum exam on women. Um, stage um, stage based treatment that guides treatment and these it, the only time it's different in pregnancy is when you want to give those two doses um, possibly for early latent syphilis or primary and secondary um, and that seven day um, dosing interval uh, ideally in pregnancy. Congenital syphilis is preventable with screening and early treatment and in, within IHS it's three times screening for all pregnant persons. So thank you so much. I uh, want to highlight the consultation service that's already been mentioned, and then I'm going to introduce Dr. Plotzker. Uh, so it really gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce one of my colleagues. I've worked with her for numerous years now. She's an assistant professor at UCSF in the Department of Epi and Biostats. She also um, works at the UCSF Anal Neoplasia Clinic. Um, she completed a fellowship in STDs with the CAPTC, our organization, and the California Department of Public Health, and she's a public health medical officer in the STD control branch. And I'm, I'm going to 
take you can take it away, Dr. Plotzker. Thank you, Dr. Adler. Um, okay, so is that did, I'm gonna pause and share my screen, and um, while I'm doing that, I encourage everyone to like take a stretch. It's always good. Uh, okay. So can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Can you see my slides? Just make sure that they're slide shown. Okay, we're good to go? Yes, that looks good now, Ross. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, we're almost there. It's um, almost all finished um, and we're gonna wrap up with congenital syphilis. This is, you know, we've talked about syphilis overall then how that, shows up in pregnancy and congenital syphilis is ultimately the outcome if you don't provide prenatal care and then you have an infant who's born with syphilis, right? Or someone who is who doesn't get treated during the prenatal period. So some of this is gonna overlap with Dr. Adler's presentation, Dr. Park's presentation and Dr. Hamp's presentation just because syphilis plays a role in um, congenital syphilis as well. Um, and so I'll be, sort of echoing back to previous presentations. I am gonna talk a little bit about the epidemiology um, and then we'll review the pathophysiology and manifestations and get into treatment and management. I do talk about screening again. I know you've heard it a couple of times. I do think repetition helps people remember. Um, so I won't belabor the point, but I am gonna talk about screening at the end. So <clears throat> some epidemiology. Um, and this is mostly to set the stage, you know, since Dr. Park talked about this in the beginning, I won't belabor the point of this either. Um, but what I do want you to see is kind of the big picture of where syphilis falls with regard to gender, um, just to set the stage. And so here you can see that in 2021, just as a snapshot, um, about a quarter, 22.8% of syphilis cases that were primary and secondary syphilis, which as we know is the um, earliest stage um, and sort of a proxy for what we would consider transmission. Um, about a quarter of that was occurring in people who, I, who were uh, women. And then um, another 20.9% were men who have sex with women only. Okay, um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is to have you start to think a little bit about what the transmission patterns are. Um, and here you can see in this graph, this is also national data, um, you can see that in 20, or excuse me, in 2000, the rate of male syphilis started to increase. And then in 2010 is when we start seeing the rate of uh, female syphilis increase. Um, and you can look at the ratio of males with syphilis to females with syphilis and see that relative to females, um, less males had syphilis. So this is sort of a, a slightly convoluted way of saying that the transmission of syphilis has shifted in the last 30 years um, or 20 years, 20 to 30 years um, to go from primarily male to male transmission to male to female transmission as well. So we're seeing more heterosexual transmission. Um, and with an increase in syphilis among females, we're also seeing an increase in congenital syphilis. So essentially a proportion of females who have syphilis are pregnant and then a proportion of those um, transmit syphilis um, via the placenta to the fetus. And so you can see the very clear parallel here where this black line is primary and secondary syphilis rates among females and then these blue bars are congenital syphilis counts or cases. All right, this is just a map um, and it compares the primary and secondary syphilis rates among women to congenital syphilis rates by state. And you can see over time how parallel they are. I'm gonna play it one more time just cause it's kind of fun to watch. You can see um, regionally where um, the increases occurred and how it really does parallel over time. Okay. Um, a little bit more national epi. This is just showing the ages of females who are diagnosed with primary and secondary syphilis. Primarily, it's been increasing in people who are in their late 30s, early 40s, if you look at the slope of this, but we're seeing higher rates in people in their 20s 
and early 30s. So essentially 20s and early 30s um, is where you see the highest rates. And this is something Dr. Park talked about as well, but um, we do see that American Indian and Alaska Natives as of 2021 had the highest rate of primary and secondary syphilis. Um, and so that's very important. Um, and in 2021, it surpassed that of uh, people who identify as Black and African American. This is looking at congenital syphilis comparing the total live births and reported cases by race and ethnicity. This is in 2021. And so essentially what you can compare is on the left, the percent of live births in general in the country. So for example, 52.2% of live births were white. But then when you look at the congenital syphilis cases, 27.4% of congenital syphilis cases were white. And then when you look at the um, uh, percentages, um, you can see where the main differences are and where the disparities are. So although 14.3% of total live births were Black or African American, 31% of congenital syphilis cases were Black or African American. And for, um, uh, excuse me, for American Indian and Alaska Natives, 0.7% of total live, live births were AIAN, but compare that to the percent of congenital syphilis cases, it's 3.6%. So it's much, much, it's a much higher um, proportion. All right. Um, so, in California, and I know that this is slightly old data and it's from California specifically, but I do like to include it in this presentation because it highlights um, where the timing of first prenatal care plays a role. And so what we see is that mothers of congenital syphilis infants or birthing parents of congenital syphilis infants, um, only about a third of them started prenatal care in the first two trimesters which as Dr. Adler talked about, the earlier you do treatment, the better. Um, and so only a third of people who delivered an infant with congenital syphilis actually went to prenatal care in the first two trimesters. And the remainder either had no prenatal care or they started prenatal care in their first trimester, or we just don't know if they had prenatal care and or when. Um, but this is based on our surveillance data. Um, all right, so that's that's the um, basic epi that I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna shift into pathophysiology and manifestations of congenital syphilis specifically. I know that we're familiar with this already. I just wanna bring it up again to remind you that these are the stages that we're gonna be talking about um, when we talk about transmission during pregnancy. We have our primary with our shanker. We have our secondary with our secondary signs that Dr. Hamp went into in detail. Um, and then our latent stages early and late latent or unknown duration. And neurosyphilis can happen at any of these stages, but more importantly for this topic, transmission from mother to fetus can occur at any of these stages. So one thing that comes up a lot um, when I do consults for people who are pregnant is how do you stage someone as having early latent syphilis? I just wanna bring this up briefly because it comes up so much and it really impacts, as Dr. Um, Adler mentioned, what type of treatment we give people who are pregnant. So if you have a patient who has latent syphilis, you can diagnose them as having early latent syphilis if in the past 12 months before their syphilis diagnosis, any of these following things are true. If you have tighter evidence, meaning if you have documented zero conversion or there's a sustained meaning two weeks or more for fourfold increase in their RPR or VDRL titers. Um, if someone's had syphilis in the past and they were treated in the past. Otherwise, if you have a history of symptoms that are unequivocally primary, meaning a chancre or secondary, any of the symptoms that uh, Dr. Hamp discussed, they have a known exposure. So a sex partner has documented primary, secondary, or early latent, or if the only possible exposure occurred in the last 12 months. So these are all really, really helpful if you are treating somebody who has syphilis and it's latent syphilis, and um, you really wanna see, could this be treated with a single IM injection? Like I would dig a little deep and ask them about all of these criteria, okay? Um, one of the reasons that this is so important is because a majority of pregnant patients 
are diagnosed as having late syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration. Again, this is a little California data, but I think it's it's um, true for the country overall, um, is that the majority are diagnosed with late syphilis or unknown duration. And as we know, that requires more extensive treatment. Um, and if that treatment gets interrupted, then that can be problematic in terms of congenital syphilis diagnosis. Um, all right, so back to fetuses. Um, syphilis is vertically transmitted. It is transmitted via the placenta and very rarely it can happen through contact of an infectious lesion at birth if there's like a chancre in the vaginal canal. This is something that is incredibly, incredibly rare. It's something that would be like a case report. So primarily we think of this as being transmitted through the placenta in utero. It's associated with early maternal stage of disease and high maternal disease titers. And as we know, titers tend to be higher in the earlier stages of syphilis and it reflects the um, bacterial load and disease burden, okay? Now, how that bacteria affects the fetus when the fetus does become infected is really complicated. Um, and I'm not gonna go into this too much, but T. pallidum, the bacteria that causes syphilis, can actually vegetate in fetal tissues, meaning that it can just sit there and not do anything until the appropriate biological conditions are there for the virus to become virulent and become pathogenic. So um, this can happen in late stage infections, in um, postpartum congenital syphilis cases, and it can contribute to one of the reasons why neonates are often asymptomatic at birth. So it could be that there's vegetating T. pallidum, which is why one of the reasons, um, excuse me, which is why the uh, infants often appear completely normal and have a normal physical exam. Um, it's also one of the reasons why treatment is really important, even in late pregnancy and in the postpartum period. There's also this interesting hypothesis about protective apoptosis of infected cells at the maternal fetal interface, i.e. the placenta, which is that um, when, a, when cells become infected with T. pallidum within the placenta, sometimes they'll undergo self-destruction in order to protect the fetus from that bacteria continuing to invade. So that's one hypothesis. And then the other, um, the other theory is that uh, the virulence of the bacteria could actually be further modulated by the, the maternal immune response to T. pallidum um, and even the fetus's genetic background. So the fetus itself might have some genetic predisposition to being susceptible to T. pallidum or um, or protective against T. pallidum infection. So there's all kinds of things that can happen and um, untangling this is really hard. So that's one of the reasons why we um, you know, really emphasize just treating during pregnancy rather than trying to understand exactly what's going on in utero. Um, you can do a um, you can do a, a amniotic fluid um, analysis that shows T pallidum um, for research purposes, but we don't do this routinely in terms of uh, clinical care. So in one study, there was an isolation of the bacteria from about three quarters of specimens from pregnancies with early syphilis, and that's just to demonstrate that yes, T pallidum is crossing the placenta in early syphilis. It happens about three out of four times, um, and it suggests that the um, the bacteria can go through fetal membranes and therefore um, infect the fetus. But again, this is not something that I would recommend you doing as part of prenatal care um, because amniocentesis, number one, isn't necessary for treatment, and number two, has risks of its own. In terms of sonography, that is something that we do, um, and it's recommended if the fetus is 20 weeks gestation or more. Um, you don't really need to do it before 20 weeks, um, and even after 20 weeks, getting this sonography done, if there's any logistic issues, shouldn't delay treatment. So even if someone hasn't had their sonogram, go ahead and treat them. Um, on sonogram, you can see signs of congenital syphilis in utero. And they're listed here. You have hepatomegaly or enlarged liver. That's the most common. We see it in 70 to 80% of cases. Um, thickened placenta, ascites. So here you can see there's this little black stripe 
um, in the cross section of the fetus, and that's ascites, that's just fluid coming from the liver, um, and then the liver cross section is here too. There's non-immune hydrops and then also fetal anemia. And so when you have an ultrasound and there are abnormalities, uh, then you want to have consultation with an MFM or maternal fetal medicine doctor if possible, but it doesn't change the treatment in pregnancy for this. It's mostly to monitor and see that these symptoms resolve, or if they haven't resolved, that MFM is on board at birth to manage any complications. Okay, so speaking of birth, um, manifestations of congenital syphilis can be seen at the time of birth um, or even years after. There are early manifestations, and these are the ones that are seen um, before two years of age. And the early manifestations come from excuse me, hematogenous spread of T pallidum, so via the blood, and then the resulting inflammatory response in the different organs and tissues. And as we know, T pallidum can go into pretty much every organ and every tissue. Um, this is an immune-mediated process, uh, and so this happens usually earlier in life, um, uh, definitely by two years of age. The later manifestations have a different mechanism. So later manifestations are the result of scarring or stigmata from that earlier disease. And it's a reaction to persistent inflammation. So these are non-infectious, they're not immune mediated, and they'll happen after two years of age. So here's some early manifestations. Uh, like I said, they usually happen pretty early within the first eight weeks. They can happen up to two years. And um, hepatomegaly, here it is again, an enlarged liver. Also splenomegaly, the spleen can be enlarged. You can have nasal secretions, and these do have the treponemes in them. So you can see a picture here of uh, what we call knuckle. knuckle. Um, you can also have mucocutaneous lesions. You, you can see these on the skin, and they also have treponemes. They can be infectious. In addition to that, um, pneumonia alba, it can impact the bones and cause osteochondritis. It can cause pseudoparalysis, edema, rash, and blood dyscrasias like hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia. Okay, so these are early manifestations um, that you can see on exam. Late manifestations, which are the ones that happen after two years old, typically I think of these as um, impacting the connective tissues. Um, so you can see ophthalmic and neurologic disorders. Sometimes um, you can see people who are in their, you know, teens even develop corneal scarring um, or uh, visual problems relating to the chronic inflammation in the eye um, with interstitial keratitis. You can also in people's teens, 20s, even 30s start to develop some nerve deafness because of acranial nerve involvement. You can see dental findings. You know, sometimes this might be noted on a dental exam. You'll see Hutchinson teeth and mulberry molars. Here's some Hutchinson teeth with some notching. Um, and then you can have skeletal abnormalities. Uh, you know, these are classic things that mostly we read about in textbook nowadays, but we can have anterior bowing of the shins, which are called saber shins. Here's a picture on the bottom row in the middle. Um, you can also see frontal bossing of the forehead and clutton joints. So these can, these can impact the long bones. They can impact the flat bones. Frontal bossing is up here on the top row in the top right corner. And then you can have these facial findings like perioral fissures at the corner of the mouth and saddle nose. So these are all things that we find much later in life. Um, and you can even see that these are uh, older pictures just based on the, the photos. Um, so we don't see them as often anymore. In terms of mortality, this is the uh, worst outcome of congenital syphilis, obviously. Um, mortality has, it, it's kind of hard to um, explore. Pablo Sanchez at Ohio Children's did a really, really nice study where he looked at 191 cases of confirmed congenital syphilis. Uh, and that meant that he demonstrated that there was in fact T pallidum present in the tissues of the fetus. Um, you know, when we talk about congenital syphilis in public health, we talk about different scenarios, but he looked at cases that 100% had T pallidum present. And he found that the mortality among those cases was 35%, which is quite high. 80% of these were stillbirths, um, okay, or excuse me, 79%, but um, four out of five 
congenital syphilis deaths were stillbirths, um, meaning that they uh, died in utero and it was after 20 weeks gestation. And the majority of the stillbirths were 28 weeks gestation or younger. So three out of four of these stillbirths happened sometime between 20 and 28 weeks gestation. So it really, really emphasizes the importance of treating early, meaning ideally before 20 weeks. Um, and prenatal treatment, you know, it really dramatically reduces the risk of congenital syphilis stillbirth. This is a really nice meta-analysis. It's by Hannah Blankow. And um, it found that it, the when prenatal treatment is delivered and it's according to the stage of maternal disease, the adjusted risk ratio drops to 0.18, which is very, very low. So it really has a, a profound impact on the likelihood of fetal survival. This is a nice mathematical model. Um, I love this one. I know it's just a mathematical model. Um, and so it's not you know, surveillance data, but um, what this model showed um, was that about 70% of congenital syphilis stillbirths were likely avoidable if treatment was given by 21 weeks gestation. Okay. Um, and this is something that Dr. Adler showed. I'm including it too. I love this graph. Um, and just to emphasize a few things that uh, Dr. Adler mentioned that I want to emphasize um, <clears throat> is that the, you know, a lot of the time uh, maternal titers are not going to decline fourfold by delivery. Um, and for secondary and primary syphilis, you do see a fourfold decline or you can see a fourfold decline. It's much more likely when you have latent syphilis, whether it's unknown duration, late latent or early latent, the titers at diagnosis tend to be lower and it can take longer for those titers to drop that fourfold. Um, so, you know, what you do is you want to repeat the RPR eight weeks after prenatal treatment, unless you see some signs of primary and secondary syphilis, and any syphilis diagnosed and treated at 24 weeks gestation, you want to repeat the serology at delivery. Post-treatment ser serologic response really varies. It varies widely. Um, and if you see that sustained fourfold increase after treatment, then you want to think about reinfection or neurosyphilis. So that's just my little PSA to piggyback on what Dr. Adler talked about. All right. So back to infants exposed to syphilis in utero. Um, when you have an infant who is exposed to syphilis in pregnancy, um, at delivery, you need to get a non-treponemal titer. So RPRs are most common. VDRL is also an option. And you need to do both the birthing parent or mother and infant, oops, excuse me, infant titers at delivery because you're going to compare these. You also want to perform the same test. So you want to compare RPRs to RPRs, VDRL to VDRL. Um, you do not need to do a TREP test for infants. And um, the... Reason is that a TPPA can be positive from the uh, blood of the birthing parents and can stay positive in the infant for up to 15 months. So it really doesn't tell you much um, and, and it can be a source of confusion. So do not get a uh, TREP test when you are evaluating infants. All right, so now that you have your RPR and your VDRL, I'm gonna walk you through the different scenarios, okay? and. Um, just highlighting this is for infants who were exposed to syphilis in utero who are under 30 days old. So if it's more, if it's a, a baby who's older than 30 days, then this is a little different. So just keep that in mind. Um, all right. So first, you want to look at what's called infant criteria. So you look at the infant. Are there any findings on physical exam? Did they have any snuffles? Do they have any mucocutaneous lesions, et cetera? Look in the mouth. Are there any mucus patches? Um, so look for physical findings. Um, also hepatomegaly, you know, splenomegaly. You compare the titers. Um, and you can also look, if you have access to this, at the results of either a dark field or PCR of the placenta, the cord lesion, body fluids, um, and also looking to see if you send the uh, placenta or the cord to path if they do a silver stain. Um, and so if any of these are, uh, are positive, if any of these are found, if the infant's titer is fourfold higher than the mother's, that's the most common 
finding. Um, if there's a yes to any of these, then you do an infant evaluation, and this infant would be considered a proven or highly probable congenital syphilis, okay? And for that, you wanna do a CSF analysis, including a VDRL a cell count of white blood cells and protein. You wanna do a CBC or a complete blood count um, with diff and looking at platelets, looking for blood dyscrasias. And then you wanna do long bone x-rays and you want to look at other tests as they're clinically indicated by the uh, infant's physical exam. So for example, if there was hepatomegaly, then you would do um, a workup relating to the infant's hepatomegaly. Um, regardless of these results, you want to give this baby uh, aqueous penicillin G. So this infant is going to the NICU and they will get IV treatment, okay? Um, and you can see the regimen listed here. All right, if the infant looks totally normal, if the titer is not fourfold higher, higher than the mom's and there's no other evidence of syphilis, then you wanna look at maternal criteria. And so was the uh, birthing parent or mother adequately treated? Um, were they treated according to their stage of disease? Were they treated with a uh, benzathine penicillin G regimen, um, and were they treated within 30 days of delivery or, or prior to 30 days of delivery? So essentially, look at maternal uh, treatment, okay? If they were not adequately treated, meaning if they were not treated, inadequately treated, it wasn't documented, it wasn't penicillin G, um, or it was after 30 days prior to delivery, then this infant does need a workup as well. It's the same, CSF, CBC, long bone x-rays. Um, you, you don't need to do additional tests because the baby had a normal physical exam. Um, and this would be considered a scenario two infant, which is possible congenital syphilis. Um, if the tests are abnormal, if any of them are abnormal, then this infant would also get IV penicillin. The reason that IV penicillin is so important is because it can cross into the CSF and it can treat for potential neuro involvement. So if any of these tests are abnormal, meaning CSF, CBC, or long bone x-ray, then that increases the likelihood that there's neuro involvement. For scenario one, which is proven or highly probable, um, these initial infant criteria findings also increase the likelihood of there being neuro involvement. And so the treatment that you give, you wanna make sure that that can get into the CSF, it can cross the blood brain barrier and it can treat any possible neurological infection. However, if all of these tests are normal and follow-up is certain, cause you wanna make sure you can get this baby back in, um, then you can treat with just an IM injection of benzathine penicillin G. So you don't have to admit this kid to the NICU you don't have to give them the 10 days of IV penicillin. It's okay to send them home as long as you can have them come back because it, their infant criteria is okay. The titer's reassuring, the physical exam is okay, and all of their additional testing is normal, despite the fact that the birthing parent was not adequately treated. Um, this kid might not have um, neuro involvement, but you do wanna treat them with IM penicillin um, to cover Extra, nerve, extra neurological symptoms, or excuse me, um, infection, meaning outside of, the nerve, outside of the nervous system. All right, if mom was adequately treated, so let's say mom was adequately treated um, and there is not concern for reinfection or treatment failure, then you don't have to do an evaluation. We are this confident in our prenatal treatment. And so you don't have to do the evaluation, you don't have to do a, um, uh, a lumbar puncture or a CVC or a long bone x-ray, then what you can do is review the maternal titers. Um, you wanna look and see if there was a fourfold decrease in the titer after treatment, if the uh, mom had early syphilis. And you can also look if they had latent syphilis, whether it was early or late latent, um, and look at their titers overall. And did they have stable titers, meaning was the RPR less than one to two, or if she was monitored with VDRLs, was it less than one to two? Um, VDRLs tend to run a little lower. Um, and if she did not have that fourfold increase for early syphilis, 
or she did not have, and excuse me, and if she did not have um, stable low titers, if neither of these are true, then the infant should get a dose of IM benzathine penicillin G for good measure. We're confident, however, um, these are the only two scenarios when you can really feel okay about not giving the infant any treatment. Um, if the answer is yes for either of these, and you're sure that the infant can come an IM dose of benzathine penicillin G, provided that you can bring the infant back and make sure that you can do follow-up RPRs. Um, you know, I, I tend to err on the side of caution and give and, you know, feel better if infants get the IM dose of benzathine penicillin G. But if you have an infant who didn't get treatment and was discharged, you can look back and check, was the mom adequately treated? Was there a fourfold decrease or was the titer stable? And if these are true, then you could, um, you could just evaluate the infant's uh, titers um, in, in two to three months for six months and make sure that the titers go down to non-reactive, okay? Um, there's something called scenario four. Oh, sorry. And th there are also, I'm including this on the slide for your reference, but there's many, many caveats to this. Um, and here are all the footnotes for your reference. Um, scenario four is the uh, scenario that's not on this slide and, excuse me, is not on the uh, flow chart. This is something where congenital syphilis is unlikely. And so this is essentially somebody who was born to a mom or birthing parent who was adequately treated before pregnancy and they're zero fast. So they have a low stable non-TREP titer before and during pregnancy and at delivery, but they are zero fast. They were treated prior to pregnancy. They do not currently have syphilis. You don't need to do an evaluation. You don't need to treat. Some experts would give a single dose of benzathine penicillin G just because they want to be careful and if follow-up's uncertain, that's the safer thing to do. Um, but zero fast does not expose infants to syphilis, okay? Um, I'm not going to read this verbatim to you, but just so you have it, here is the IV penicillin regimen, and it's appropriate for scenario one infants, scenario two infants with abnormalities, or if the results are not available or follow-up is uncertain. And then here is the IM penicillin regimen with benzathine penicillin G, which we give to scenario two infants who don't meet criteria for IV penicillin and scenario three infants um, where you have um, a mother with early syphilis who did not have that fourfold decrease or a mother with latent syphilis who did not have a, a stable low titer throughout pregnancy, okay? Um, for infants and children who are older than 30 days or a month, um, here's what you do. Um, if, you have a, if you have an infant who's older than 30 days um, and they were exposed to syphilis and they didn't get a workup and nothing happened, they were just discharged, the first thing you wanna do is get an RPR. Then if the RPR is positive, regardless of if mom was adequately treated, regardless of um, any of those factors on that previous flowchart, if you have an infant with a positive RPR who's older than a month, you want to do a CSF analysis, a CBC, you want to screen them for HIV, and then do other tests as indicated by their uh, physical exam. And you want to treat them with aqueous crystalline penicillin G, um, which is the IV regimen for 10 days. If all of the tests that you do are normal and this infant just has the positive RPR, then you can consider giving them benzathine penicillin GIM. And the difference is that this infant needs three weekly injections rather than a single injection. And you also wanna notice, I bolded it here, that the dose is different for the IV penicillin. Okay, so you wanna confirm that um, if you have a, an infant who's older than 30 days, that they were given this 200 to 300,000 units rather than the um, rather than the younger, I'll just point it out to you, um, the younger than 30 days, which is half that, 100 to 150, okay? All right, follow-up for neonates. So neonates who have an initial uh, CSF evaluation that's abnormal do not need to repeat that lumbar puncture unless they have a persistent non-TREP, aka RPR test at uh, six to 12 months. So as long as that RPR drops to non-reactive, you don't need to repeat the lumbar puncture. All right. 
Um, and I'm just going to go, we have a couple minutes. I'm just going to go through prevention strategies. Dr. Adler talked about this, but, but honestly, as we've already mentioned, prevention, prevention, prevention is really, really important um, for congenital syphilis. And it's really the emphasis of um, how to de decrease um, our rate of CS. So, you know, we have, uh, we have a couple of examples of screening guidelines. Um, I have the California one up here just because that's the one that, um, that's where I work is California. And in 2021, CDC also updated theirs. And I know Dr. Adler highlighted IHSs. Um, so I'll, I'll get mostly into CDCs, which is prior to pregnancy screen asymptomatic women at increased risk. Um, and among those who are living with HIV, for sexually active individuals, you wanna screen at the first HIV evaluation and then at least annually, more frequently depending on epidemiology. Um, speaking of HIV, um, this is something that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that I really, really like. It's by our colleague, um, Ginny Bowen and Bobby McDonald and their colleagues at CDC. And it, it basically says that um, you can think about how we reduced perinatal transmission of HIV and adapt that to syphilis. Um, and so that includes prevention of infection in women, increasing prenatal testing, and also advances in maternal treatment. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, it would be, uh, I, some of this is beyond the scope of, of our lecture or public health interventions, but I do think, you know, for example, could we develop a single dose of um, a treatment that can treat late latent disease, and then we can avoid having multiple doses for late latent disease, and then we can ensure better treatment um, uh, adherence, things like that. You know, um, so that's the research. Uh, it's a research thought, but it's just a thought to um, keep in your brain, um, just thinking long term in the future. Obviously, that doesn't exist yet, but I do think that advances in treatment in the prenatal period could be really helpful. Um, and this, this comment just puts everything in perspective of HIV. Um, anyway, okay. So for syphilis and pregnancy, we talked about screening since we don't have any magical treatments yet. Um, in pregnancy, as Dr. Adler mentioned, um, CDC recommends screening at the first prenatal visit and at 28 weeks and delivery, depending on risk factors. Um, and that you want to manage non-TREP and um, uh, TREP screening tests um, as highlighted here, which I talked about earlier, but just putting it here again. Um, penicillin allergy does come up a lot in pregnancy. So I did want to include it in this. Um, Dr. Adler mentioned that there is a specific way to desensitize penicillin is the only treatment. Um, and so a few things that you could do is just make sure that your penicillin allergy is in fact IgE mediated um, and what a patient means by allergy. Um, and you can use history to validate penicillin allergy or work with an allergist on that, okay? All right, but most importantly is uh, prenatal care gaps. So, you know, when I think of congenital syphilis cases and the rise of congenital syphilis, if you're thinking about it big picture, I'm going to zoom out again just because, um, you know, I only I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, I really think that we could think of the rise in congenital syphilis cases as a proxy for prenatal care access for people who are at risk for syphilis. In California, again, this is earlier data, it's just a nice visualization to highlight what we've talked about earlier in um, with Dr. Park's lecture, that the majority of cases have late or no prenatal care. So in California, between 2016 and 17, you know, it's a, it's a few years old, but it's still um, a similar situation. Over half of congenital syphilis was the consequence of having late or no prenatal care. And I know that Dr. Park mentioned that nationally, this number is a little lower. It's about 37%. Uh, but among American Indian and Alaska Natives, it's higher. It's almost half, um, you know, 47%. And so access to prenatal care is, is highlighted by the rise in congenital syphilis, but it also raises the question of prenatal care access more generally. Um, so for congenital syphilis, as well as prenatal care access in general, um, you, you, I, I think that it's incredibly important 
Um, and that is where you will have testing for syphilis in the third trimester at delivery um, and um, also in prenatal care clinics. And then you can think outside of prenatal care, things like uh, correction settings, drug treatment settings, emergency departments, family planning settings, primary care, reproductive age, um, uh, people who could become pregnant. You can also look at treatment and think about where treatment can be delivered and then higher up on the chain, think about case review, public health, and um, if there are alternative models to delivering prenatal care. Is this something that we could increase access to via substance use treatment programs, via social support services, um, and what things are barriers to access to prenatal care? Um, is transportation an issue? Is housing an issue? So, um, you know, I, I do want to leave you on that note that this is really important as a, as a way to highlight the need for prenatal care access. Um, here are all of the different partners that are involved in congenital syphilis prevention. You know, so it's not just maternal, child, and adolescent health and the California Prevention Training Center. We also want to think about family planning programs prior to pregnancy, HIV programs, uh, and community-based organizations, hospitals, community centers, FQHCs, many, many more. Okay, so it's really, really a cross-cutting effort. With all that said, uh, it is 10.50 uh, in California, so it's 11.50 where you are, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues. Um, They're wonderful. They're listed here, um, and I also want to mention my colleague Tamara Ooms, who's not on this, and uh, my colleague uh, uh, Wyatt Hamm who is also not listed, but I would like to acknowledge them as well. Um, and with all that, thank you so much. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, that'd be great. I am okay. going to pull up a reminder slide about some of the CME requirements while awesome. we answer some questions. So I'll do that in a minute. But first off, thank you so much, Dr. Plotzker and Dr. Adler for those excellent talks really informative, really scientific, and I think really um, important for what we're trying to do here today, which is prevent syphilis in babies. We do have some questions in the Q&A, hooray. So I'm gonna be handing them out to you all, and then I have a question too. Um, so here's question one from our Q&A. Uh, I think this uh, came up during Dr. Adler's talk, but either of you can answer it. Um, if a pregnant person who doesn't have reliable transportation, presumably like they have syphilis of late or late, late and or unknown duration. What if they get one of their three weekly injections on day five or day six? Is that acceptable or do you have to restart? I'll, I'll take that one and I'll, I'll be interested to see if um, Dr. Plotzker or you have different answer. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's a fantastic question. We get lots of those questions in our STD CCN consult service. So if these come up in the future and um, you want to specifically check on a specific case, please um, use the consultation service. Um, I think I'd say it really depends what state you're in and what this, <laughs> because within California, we have specific guidelines that um, allow us to say six to eight days are okay. And that's actually based on some California specific data, Dr. Johnson and um, uh, a couple of other doctors from the health department were involved in a study. And we have data within California to say that six days is okay. Um, five days, I would feel a lot less comfortable with because um, we're looking at treponemocidal levels usually for 21 days. That's what the seven day interval gives us. At five days, we're down to 19 days only if we didn't um, give another dose of benzene penicillin. So I would probably be okay with six days within California, you're okay with six days. At five days, that would be one that I might give another dose, give four doses of benzene penicillin as a strategy to deal with that early dose. Um, but that's a great question for STDCCN, and I'll see if anyone else has anything to add to that. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, this is where I am not going to get on my soapbox, but I do think that it, it brings up an important point that, like, it, in public health, we care a lot about syphilis, and we really, really, really need better tests for syphilis to demonstrate that this works, because even the three-dose thing is based on very scant research, like why 21 days versus 28 days versus 14 days of treponemocidal levels. Like if you really dig back into the research, it's all kind of fuzzy. 
And that's why we end up getting these questions. Um, and, you know, honestly, like what, one of the things that I do in the STD CCN, the first thing I do is say, are you sure it's late latent? Is there any possibility that this could be early latent? Um, which isn't answering the question of like five days versus six days. But, but the real answer is that it's a very gray area because we have data on six days. We don't have data on five days. But how much does that 24 hours really matter? It's hard to know. Um, I think that the bigger issue is that congenital syphilis has such a bad outcome. The rate of, of stillbirth is so high, the potential manifestations are so high that in the long run, if you truly think that this is unknown duration, there's no way to prove that it's early, that it's better to just like be 100% sure that this person was adequately treated prior to pregnancy to avoid an infant having to undergo all of the different tests like LP and long bone x-ray and CBC. And sometimes if you talk to a mother about that or a pregnant person about that, and you say, look, if you don't get these doses, here's what would happen when you deliver your baby. The baby is going to have to get a lumbar puncture, which has risks and an x-ray and a CBC. And if any of those tests are abnormal, your baby has to go to a NICU and has to be in the NICU for 10 days. Sometimes that can help emphasize the importance of getting these in. Um, but I, I honestly think you might have to, it, it depends by state. I agree with you, Sharon. Dr. Adler, Dr. Sharon Adler. Thank you both. Yeah, it's such a tricky area and such a great question. Yeah. I'm going to just add my two cents, which is surveillance wise is where it will differ right between states. Yeah. States will define six to eight days as OK, like in California, whereas other states may not do that and may say, nope, you got to be at seven day intervals. So that is sort of defined locally. But I think clinically, there's a different um, way you could look at it, which is where I'm actually personally comfortable with the six to six to eight day intervals because we have data for it. I'm going to put that study that Dr. Adler mentioned um, in the chat. It's open access. So you can look at it if you'd like. But I think there is solid, at least the best data that that I'm aware of. Um, and it's not to promote our own stuff. It's just to say that we at least have a publication out there that does show that there's no difference in incidence of congenital syphilis if a pregnant person is treated at seven day intervals versus six to eight day intervals. So there is data to support that approach clinically. Great. Okay, let's do another one. There were a couple of questions about follow-up of babies who are exposed to syphilis in utero. So this one is to you, Dr. Plotzker. When a baby is born with congenital syphilis, at what point, if ever, will their RPR go to non-reactive? I don't know if you can predict that, if it, it may be sort of variable by case, but wondering what you think. Um, we want to see it at six, at six months. We want it to go down. So if it's not non-reactive by six months, then, you know, think, oh, you know, was this kid treated with an IM injection and there might be some neuro involvement. You might want to do a LP at that point. CDC is willing to wait up to a year. Um, I would probably get a little nervous around six months if it wasn't already down. Fair yeah. enough. It was a similar question asking. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, can I add something to that? Just to say that yeah. sometimes babies are born and they have an RPR that's negative, but it's actually incubating syphilis. So just on the yep. converse of that is that similar to in um, an adult, you can syphilis can take up to 90 days to incubate. And so just because a baby has a negative RPR doesn't mean that they don't have congenital syphilis. So just wanted to add that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's why, like we say, do follow up RPRs. Yes, 100%. Yes, I'm going to put in the, there was another question about whether California has a process for following up with babies exposed to syphilis in utero, like after age two. Um, I did respond to that one in the chat, but basically cited the CDC guidelines about follow up for infants exposed to syphilis, like checking an RPR every two to three months, wanting it to mm -hmm. go by six months and like what you should do next if it doesn't. So I am going to put that link here in the chat for everybody as well. Just give me a second to do that. There you go. Cool. And then I think we have time for for one more question. I'm going to check the Q&A. Did we answer that one? Is that one? All right. The last question then is a question from me. Um, I was just thinking, this is for you, Sharon, Dr. Adler. Um, 
I was thinking about how you were talking about for early syphilis and pregnancy, how some experts do recommend a second dose of Vicillin one week after that first dose and how, you know, different guidelines recommend that more or less strongly or just say it's optional. In the context of the current Vicillin shortages, I would think my own bias would be to sort of go with the one injection and not necessarily do a second unless there was strong data that one should. But I was curious if you would agree with that approach or if you would take an alternative approach. And there, I, there's room, I think, for opinion here. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I really, um, one thing that I do know is that IHS is not experiencing the bicillin shortage <laughs> like many other places are. So my answer, you know, if for whatever reason you have great supply of bicillin, then I still would go with a more conservative, which is one for the mom, one for the baby. Um, I really like the Britain approach, which was one for the baby if it was 28 weeks diagnosis. So kind of really trying to get at that those older fetuses, like her mom is 28 weeks gestation, longer in pregnancy, maybe even more reason to give the two doses um, because of pharmacokinetic um, issues. But um, it's, you know, it's a gray area. It's even a anecdotal, you know, some experts guidance. So I think it could be really provider dependent, but if, you know, if you happen to be working in a in a clinical setting where bicillin shortage is not really impacting you, then I would go with the two. Um, if you are in California, <laughs> outside of IHS, where we are experiencing a bicillin shortage, I might go with a one. Um, so yeah, really it's going to be, I think it's going to be provider dependent, I'm not an obstetrician. I'm not doing that much management of babies late in pregnancy. Um, so yeah, great question though. Thank you. That's a really great point though about the IHS by cell and supply. And I know you'd mentioned that to me before and apparently I had not recalled that information. So really important point there about being site specific and what your resources are uh, when you make management decisions. All right, folks, we are right at the top of the hour. So I want to end on time, respecting y'all's time. I want to thank you all so much for being here as our audience. We, again, are so excited to be building this partnership with IHS. And feel free to reach out to us if you have follow-up questions um, or if anything else comes up from here. Oh, no, and I forgot to put up the, the CME requirements slide. I'm so sorry to the administrators, but we'll um, be sending out the post-course materials, um, and you should receive emails about CME follow-up. Thank you all. Thank you.